Talking about black holes today, nerds. And to understand black holes, we have to get our heads around a basic understanding of the universe that black holes find themselves within, a universe that contains, well, everything. The universe includes all of space and all the matter and energy that space contains. It includes time itself. And of course, our galaxy, the Milky Way, and the Milky Way includes Earth, you, me, and everything you've literally ever seen or read about, everyone you've ever known, alive or dead in some form. And the Milky Way is but one of billions of galaxies in the observable, known universe. And virtually all of these galaxies, including our own, are thought to have supermassive black holes at their centers. All the black holes and all the galaxies and everything else, all part of the universe. And the portion of the universe that exists outside the confines of our planet's atmosphere is so damn close to every single one of us all of the time. Weirdly close, if you think about it. Wherever you are right now, outer space is never much more than roughly 62 miles or 100 kilometers away. If you're on the top of a tall mountain, you can subtract a few miles. If you're, for uh, some reason, deep down in some trench in the ocean, well, you're probably in a lot of trouble. And you could add a few. It's so close. Day or night, whether you're indoors or outdoors, asleep, eating lunch, dozing off in class, outer space, just a few dozen miles away. Isn't that wild? If you could drive a car straight up into the air... You could uh, leave Earth and be in outer space in under an hour. I just drove to Missoula, Montana, and back recently the same day. 330 miles round trip, not a big deal. In that same time, if I had some kind of magic flying car, I could have driven way out into space. But also, in a very real way, we're already in space. We say out in space as if it's out there and we're down here, as if Earth is separate from the rest of space and the universe. But it's all connected. Earth is but one of many planets, And it's in space and a part of the universe just like any other planet. And there are so many other planets. An estimate of the number of planets in the known universe is a one with 25 zeros behind it. 10 septillion planets. A trillion has 12 zeros behind it for comparison. An almost incomprehensible number just in the observable known universe. We are all such teeny, tiny, insignificant specks in the massiveness of the cosmos. It's believed that there are more stars and planets in the universe than there are grains of sands in the entire world. And we know almost nothing about almost any of them. We have thoroughly inspected in a close, detailed way almost nothing outside of our own atmosphere. There is still so much we don't know about the handful of other planets in our own solar system. Even though we humans have been looking to the stars, looking towards these other planets and wondering, calculating, studying, etc. for at least as long as we've been keeping written records. Most of the universe that can be known remains so very unknown. But with ever-advancing technology and knowledge and no shortage of imagination, as long as we meet sex, don't completely destroy one another first, we will learn so much more eventually. Maybe someday we'll even send some of ourselves into a black hole. Or maybe not. From what we currently theorize about black holes, that would not work out very well at all. It'd be a very unpleasant way to die. We think. We're still learning so much about all of this. I learned a lot this past week, and I hope you learn so much over the next few hours. Today, we're looking at some of the most fascinating cosmological phenomena in existence, supernovas and black holes, dark matter and wormholes, and also charting our species' understanding of how it all works. We'll zoom through space and time to go all the way back to the Big Bang, the formation of our universe, the development of galaxies, stars, black holes, and more. We'll also look at the ideas of those who think most of our space talk— notions of the Big Bang, black holes, etc. Just a bunch of gibberish promoted by arrogant, God-hating scientists. But is it? Can all of this actually be very compatible with religion? It can, actually. It absolutely can. We'll look at that, too. How I believe that the world of science and the world of religion can 100% coexist. As long as you're willing to interpret theological teachings with a bit of an interpretive mind. Black holes, the universe... And the very nature of the existence of both all that we can see and all that we cannot see but still believe to exist. All that right now on a sci-fact can sure feel like sci-fi, mind candy, conversation fodder. Let's all at least feel a little smarter after absorbing this heady, trippy nature of our existence, Black Hole Sun edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks, and welcome to the Cult of the Curious. 
I'm Dan Cummins, the master sucker, destroyer, possibly, of the Library of Alexandria. Got to make sure the statute of limitations has run out on that. Maker of adult keychains. And you are listening to Time Suck. A uh, happy seventh anniversary to this show. Uh, Time Suck's first episode came out on September 19th, 2016. And what a wild ride it has been ever since. Uh, we also now have over 20,000 reviews on Apple Podcasts, over 13,000 reviews on Spotify, and many more reviews other places. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Every review truly helps. Uh, well, most of them. The five-star reviews truly help. Some of the others, not so much. Uh, it has been humbling to get so many good reviews. They all help us find new curious meat sacks to bring into this interesting little ecosystem we have here. Uh, also, thanks to everyone who's uh, been watching, sharing, liking, leaving comments under my new stand-up special on YouTube, trying to get better. Uh, it has to have the most absurd comment section of any stand-up special on YouTube now. Uh, at Chris Aker, DV2BU posted, we need to have some keychains with big balls and a nice shaft. Uh, <laughs> at Connor Aarons, 9824 posted, I'm just so glad something good could come from a man whose father is one of the most prolific serial killers to ever walk the earth. I would like to think Dan's comedy somewhat offsets the horrific deeds of his dad. Yeah, there's so much nonsense so much more than that uh so thank you also once you've seen the special come check out the new hour that's coming together come to chicago i'm gonna be doing a show at the vic november 3rd as part of the 312 comedy festival uh it's gonna be a really fun show and more shows at dancomas.tv and that's it other than i hope everyone coming to the wet hot bad magic summer camp has the best time this week and now for a topic that covers pretty much everything to ever exist aka the cosmos our Patreon supporting space lizards voted for me to suck some black holes, and I did not interpret that as a deep dive into either buttholes or a racially, uh, a racially defined subgenre of pornography. So here we are. I'm sucking vortexes created by collapsing stars that destroy everything in their path and proximity. Before covering black holes today, including what might happen to you if you got sucked into one, and the possibility that black holes may have already passed through Earth, we'll also be taking a big uh, macro view of things. Extremely macro. The most macro of all macro uh, zoom-outs. Today, we'll be putting on our Bill Nye Science Guy hats and looking at the entire universe. All existing matter and space considered as a, a whole to understand where black holes fit into all of that. And we'll examine our currently culturally divided view of space and the nature of the cosmos as well. A lot of shit. So how are we going to cover all of this? First, we'll jump into a brief timeline covering the history of we meet sacks, speculating about and studying how Earth fits into the cosmos and how we came to our present understanding of the universe at large. And it is so large. Uh, what did we think about the cosmos before we had modern science with all its telescopes and calculators and satellites and spaceships and shit? Uh, how have our religious ideas interacted with how we look at and study the cosmos throughout human history? How did people begin to make the first discoveries about outer space, leading to the modern theory of relativity, current hopes for intergalactic travel, and more? Then we'll hop out of the timeline and cover current notions of various aspects of our universe, how the universe began, starting with the Big Bang Theory. We'll look at our own planet, how the scientific community currently believes life was created and evolved and continues to evolve here, how the scientific community's belief differs from the beliefs of creationists and those who adhere to the concept of intelligent design, and also how faith and science can coexist and not oppose one another. That's right. You sure as shit can be someone who is both very religious and also very scientific. Don't let certain narrow-minded atheists or narrow-minded religious leaders tell you any different. Don't let them invent any boxes that they then say you have to exist inside of. Nobody puts baby in a corner. You can have all sorts of different combinations of beliefs. Belief paradigms are just as limitless as stars in the universe. Stars that can collapse into black holes. Now get in here, crawl up that ladder, and hop aboard my spaceship. And yes, my spaceship has a fucking ladder. It's a base model. Please don't make fun of it. It was a lease return, and I got a very good deal on it. Time suck timeline. Engage. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. Long, long before we had any access to modern scientific technology, we meet Zach's began to try to untangle the mysteries of the cosmos. 
in the 16th century BCE, Mesopotamian cosmology reconstructed from Sumerian and Akkadian writings showed a belief in a flat circular earth enclosed in a cosmic ocean, a mythological motif that would appear in many subsequent cosmologies describing a cosmos that was like a, a body of water from which the earth arose. The cosmic ocean represents or embodies chaos. And uh, what a bunch of fucking idiots. They actually believed that the earth was flat. Can you believe it? Can you believe those fucking morons? Now that we have satellites and spaceships and telescopes and a much greater understanding of science in general, now, of course, no one would believe in something that utterly ridiculous. No one would be that fucking stupid. Wait, no, no, we still have people. We still have a lot of people, actually, who uh, still truly believe that the earth is flat. Uh, And we always will, (laughs) I imagine. No one can force you to change your thoughts or imprison your imagination for better or for so much worse. You can believe anything you want to, no matter how utterly absurd that belief might be. Uh, From the 15th to the 11th centuries BCE, ancient Hindu beliefs described the universe originating from a golden egg-like image, whose name literally translates to golden womb or universal womb. And this has to, uh, and this has, of course, uh, excuse me, been proven to be a, you know, 100% true. Uh, you, you dig into some scientific scholarly articles about the nature of the cosmos, and, and you will find a bunch of nerds who just won't shut up about how the entire universe was once uh, the yolk inside a massive golden egg. Mm-hmm. And we've been looking for the massive space chicken who laid that egg ever since, or space Sasquatch, something that Nimrod laid that egg. It only makes sense that the god of the suck first shits gold. Hail Nimrod. It is likely, of course, that Lucifina helped get that magic egg out of his magic ass by sticking a finger in there when they were maybe doing some space fucking or something. I don't know. There's a lot of theories about the origins of the universe. And I might be the only one who, uh, you know, may believe in that one. Uh, The most ancient record of a comet sighting comes from 1057 BCE. Long time ago. The ancient Chinese were meticulous in keeping a variety of astronomical records as they struggled to figure out the cosmos, enabling modern historians to establish that Chinese astronomy goes back to at least 1800 BCE. Astronomy was very much a part of ancient Chinese royal life, and emperors directly employed astronomers to chart the heavens and record the phenomena of celestial bodies, like comets, taking detailed notes and recording the time of sightings accurately. As a result, the Chinese developed an extensive system of the zodiac designed to help guide the life of people here on Earth. As is the case with Western astrology, the Chinese had 12 houses. They also divided the sky into four quarters with seven mansions in each, making 28 in total, and these were used to chart the position of the moon as it crossed through the sky. The Chinese zodiac signs still used today are thought to have been developed in the 5th century BCE, roughly 2,500 years ago. And maybe they were influenced by people from the Mesopotamian Valley that might have traded with, you know, the, uh, the Babylonians, or they might have traded with the Babylonians, excuse me. Jury is divided on if that happened or not. Uh, The Babylonians are believed to have come up with their 12 zodiac signs over a thousand years earlier in the 19th century BCE. Uh, Back to China, the ancient Chinese had uh, some pretty fantastic, sweet notions about the cosmos. They believe that solar eclipses occurred when a celestial dragon devoured the sun. They also believe that this dragon attacked the moon during lunar eclipses. In the Chinese language, the term for eclipse also means to eat. I love it. Think about how much more exciting eclipses would be if we still truly believe that fucking space dragons are out there, right? Zipping around through the cosmos, I don't know, popping out of their space caves here and there, getting off their space gold hills or whatever they would be doing, occasionally go- gobbling up the sun or moon, I guess, I don't know, spitting them back out. Just, oh no, space dragon, please. We need we need that. We, we really need that. Stop eating our sun, you son of a bitch. Oh, he, oh, he did it. He fucking did it. No more. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. oh he's spitting it back out. Oh, thank you, Space Dragon. (laughs) Ancient Chinese also believed that the earth was flat because they were fucking idiots. And luckily, no one alive now. Uh, Wait, no, we we already went over that. Uh, Actually, some people today will point to ancient China and Mesopotamia as proof (laughs) that the earth is flat. Basically, they believe that back before the Illuminati and the reptilians started controlling the narrative, right? Started controlling the dissemination of knowledge and filling our heads with their stupid lizard people propaganda. We used to know the truth. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, and those uh, same powerful, manipulative, and world-controlling reptilians just what? Just forgot to hide ancient beliefs from us? That contradict what they supposedly want us to believe now? That doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Uh, maybe instead of there being a conspiracy, maybe people back then only believed that the Earth was flat and that dragons ate the moon and shit because they didn't have telescopes. 
and so many other investigatory and or mathematical tools of modern science. Maybe that. Uh, One more uh, interesting note on the ancient Chinese. The main job of their astronomers was to chart time, announce the first day of every month, and predict accurately lunar eclipses. And if they were wrong in their predictions, (laughs) they were frequently beheaded. Holy shit, and you thought your job was stressful. Uh, It's going to be really hard to uh, say exactly when the next eclipse will be your highness, uh, the space dragons. (laughs) They're, They're very unpredictable. But I should be able to narrow it down to the month, maybe the week. I'm sorry, what? Uh, no, yeah. No, I, I do like having my head attached to my body very much. Why do you ask? Oh, I see. Uh, sure, sure. You know, I can go back to my books and narrow it down to the day. Hour. Really? A- hour. I need to predict. Okay. Uh, yeah. No problem, your highness. And then proceeds to quietly, uh, you know, pack stuff up at home, sneak off, start a new life, and leave his family in the middle of the night. Tough job being an ancient Chinese astronomer. Uh, Back to Mesopotamia, in the 6th century BCE, the Babylonian map of the world shows the Earth surrounded by a cosmic ocean with seven islands arranged. So it uh, forms a seven-pointed star, an image that would be reflected later in biblical cosmology. Soon the Greeks will imagine the universe as something more than a big ocean with the world bobbing in the middle like a beach ball. And yes, ball. Uh, The ancient Greeks did think the world was round. They were a pretty smart group of BCE meat sacks. Uh, they also believed a bunch of crazy shit as well. Of course, they did. It was a long time ago. Uh, the early Greeks, uh, Greeks, excuse me, believed that the first being was chaos, corresponding to the opening of the biblical book of Genesis. Right after, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It reads, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Right? It was chaos. The Greeks believed that chaos created and then mated with a goddess called night, and their offspring eventually produced all the gods and men. A universe created from chaos was in perfect keeping with the Greek belief in an unpredictable nature run by capricious gods. But in the 6th century BCE in Ionia, present-day Turkey, a new concept developed that the universe is knowable because it exhibits an internal order. There are regularities in nature that permit its secrets to be uncovered. Nature is not entirely unpredictable. There are rules. Q generations of Greek scholars doing their best to understand these rules to understand the true nature of the cosmos. Anaximander, a Greek philosopher born in 610 BCE and known as the founder of astronomy, used geometry and mathematical proportions to help map the heavens. The cosmological model he proposed was a ring of fire surrounding the earth and that it was hidden from view except through vents. And when those vents came into view for us on earth, they looked like stars, little pinpricks of light slipping through. His model also helped explain the phases of the moon. Right? Its phase depended on how wide or narrow the vent covering was. Anaximander described the Earth itself as rounded and circular with two plane surfaces, not necessarily a flat disk, more like a cylinder or stone pillar, suspended freely in space. Anaximander considered the sun as a huge object, which then led to him start considering how far away it might be. Above the Earth were in order, in his view, the other planets, the stars, the moon, and finally the sun. He believed that the components of the universe were supposed to have formed as rings, that they were shed from a fiery sphere that once surrounded the earth. Pretty good guess for someone relying on primitive math, uh, naked eye observations, and, you know, uh, not really any teachings, celestial teachings, you know, that were good from anybody before him. Another Greek, Democritus, in the 5th and 4th centuries BCE, further detailed that these worlds, aka planets, varied in distance and size. They also varied in the presence, number, and size of their suns and moons. And he theorized that they were subject to destructive collisions. Now, he wasn't right about all that, of course, but he got a lot correct. And he also invented the word atom, Greek for unable to be cut. And he believed that atoms were the ultimate particles, forever frustrating our attempts to break them into smaller pieces. Everything, he said, is a collection of atoms, intricately assembled, even us meat sacks. Nothing exists, he said, but atoms in the void. Fucking bingo, bango! That old weird god worshiping son of a bitch nailed it. 18th century, English astronomer, uh, English astronomer Thomas Wright would marvel many centuries later in 1750 CE that Democritus believed the Milky Way to be composed mainly of unresolved stars. He said long before astronomy reaped any benefit from the improved science of optics, Democritus saw, as we may say, through the eye of reason, full as far into infinity uh, infinity as the most able astronomers in more advantageous times have done since. Another important Greek space thinker was Pythagoras, 
for whom the Pythagorean theorem uh, was named, who lived in the 6th century BCE. Pythagoras was the person who first used the word cosmos to denote a well-ordered and harmonious universe, a world uh, amenable to human understanding. This would further pave the way for other philosophers and astronomers to theorize about how our universe is structured. One of those phil- uh, philosopher astronomers was Philolaeus. Philolaeus believed that the motion of planets is caused by an out of sight fire at the center of the universe, not the sun, that powers them, and that the sun and earth orbited that central fire at different distances. According to Philolaeus, the earth's in- inhabited side is always opposite to the central fire. Right, rendering it invisible to people and, you know, uh, helping us from getting fucking roasted like a bunch of s'mores. His model depicted a moving Earth simultaneously self-rotating and orbiting around an external point, but not around the sun. A few years later, the famous Athenian philosopher Plato claimed that circles and spheres are the preferred shape of the universe, aka the shape of planets. That the Earth is at the center and is circled by, ordered in to outwards, uh, the moon, sun, Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and finally what he called the fixed stars located on the celestial sphere. For Plato, the stars were fixed in place in that sphere of fire that once encircled the earth. In Plato's complex theory, the uh, uh, demiurge, the artificer artificer who created the world, uh, prescribed these circles to move in opposite directions, three of them with equal speeds and others with unequal speeds, but always in proportion. These circles are the orbits of the heavenly bodies. The three moving at equal speeds are the sun, Venus, and Mercury, while the four moving at unequal speeds are the moon, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. The complicated pattern of these movements is bound to be repeated again after a period called a complete or perfect year. Aristotle followed, uh, excuse me, man, Aristotle followed, uh, come on mouth, in Plato's footsteps, centering the spherical earth in the middle of the universe. At this point, you might be wondering, why was it the Greeks? Who came up with all this shit? Why not, uh, you know, China or India, both places with rich traditions of astronomy and mathematics at this time? Well, some historians think it has to do with the unique city-state political structure of the Greek islands. A variety of political systems existed in very close proximity to one another. Since there was no single concentration of power and forcing a top-down, you know, uh, way of thinking about the universe in an area that also shared the same basic culture and members of various city-states frequently communicated with one another, free inquiry curiosity and dissent was possible and open dialogue between people with different ideologies led to faster advancements than it would have had some king or other leader been dictating how everybody needed to think uh, but that didn't mean the other places weren't also figuring shit out in the fourth century bce the chinese astronomer Shi shen is believed to have cataloged 809 stars in 122 constellations uh, although he took little interest in, in the planets he also made the earliest known observation of sunspots to make such accurate measurements of position in the sky, the Chinese used armillary spheres, these uh, metal spheres consisting of intersecting scaled circles, which allow the observer to give uh, each star coordinate and uh, nomens, basically sundials. And of course, their most important tool was the naked eye, right? They would study the sun at sunrise and sunset when it's least harmful to the human eye. They're doing all this shit without telescopes. It's unreal. One of the craters of the moon is now named after Xi Shen. Uh, Aristarchus of Samos, a man we met two weeks ago in the Library of Alexandria, suck. He may have studied there. Uh, a man who lived sometime between 300 and 210 BCE is considered the first person to propose a scientific heliocentric model of the solar system, placing the sun, not the earth, at the center of the known universe. He also correct, uh, correctly deduced the other planets in correct order from the sun. You know, another major accomplishment. All these ancient astronomers learning from those who came before them and steadily progressing closer and closer to the truth. Despite Aristarchus of Samos being 100% correct about his heliocentric model, a lot of other people did not believe him during his lifetime. A lot of people wouldn't believe him for many, many centuries. Uh, One of the people who didn't believe him was a dude named Ptolemy. This Ptolemy, not one of the uh, sister-fucking Ptolemies of the Library of Alexandria, suck not uh, thought to be related to the Greek rulers of Alexandria, even though he did also live in Alexandria. Uh, We're talking about Claudius Ptolemy here. And around 100 CE, old Claude, whose model will be the main one in the Western world for the next 1,500 years or so, proposes an Earth-centered universe with the sun and planets revolving around the Earth. Perfect motion should be in circles, he argued, so the stars and planets being heavenly objects moved in circles. 
His book, The Almagest, which also cataloged 1,022 stars and other astronomical objects, remain the most authoritative text on astronomy and, uh, you know, the largest astronomical catalog until the 17th century, which is unfortunate because despite how smart he was uh, and, you know, he did document a lot of space shit, he had a lot of stuff wrong. The Almagest was the culmination, though, of ancient Greco-Roman astronomy. More advancements would mainly take place further east now for a long, long time. From the 5th to the 13th centuries, cosmologists outside of the European uh, or outside of Europe uh, would make serious gains in understanding the universe. Europeans, not so much, thanks to the Dark Ages. Gay people getting literally tortured, imprisoned, and banished, hanged, burned alive, etc., for daring to be curious meat stacks. Coming to logical and well-researched scientific conclusions and sharing those conclusions with others. What a world. Ban the witch. Ban the scientist. The Dark Ages, a former suck subject. Witness the near complete and total suppression of intellectual thought and scholarship across the continent. During this time, the written word became scarce and research and observations went dormant. But while Europe had fallen into a needless and entirely avoidable intellectual coma, the Islamic empire, which stretched from Moorish Spain to Egypt and even China, was entering its golden age. Astronomy was, a, was of particular interest to Islamic scholars in Iran and Iraq. In the 8th century, under a caliph of Baghdad, al uh, Mamun, the first observatory was built in Baghdad, and then subsequent observatories uh, built elsewhere in the coming years around Iraq and Iran. Since this was before the telescope had been developed, the astronomers of the time used observational sextants, instruments for determining the angle between the horizon and a celestial body, such as the sun, moon, or star. These tools, some as large as 40 meters long, were critical to the study of the angle of the sun, movement of the stars, and understanding the orbiting of the planets. They didn't help you see celestial bodies any clearer, but they did allow you to measure how far they appeared to be from one another and the path they took to travel across the sky. Middle Eastern astronomers also started to write books on astronomy. In the Book of the Fixed Stars, Islamic scholar Al-Sufi combined Ptolemy's work of mapping constellations with Arabic astronomical traditions. Written around 964, the book contains extensive illustrations of each constellation from both the terrestrial perspective, looking up from Earth, and the inverse, as the constellation would look from outside the sphere of the fixed stars. This book includes some of the first known recordings of what we would later understand to be another galaxy. Again, doing a lot of shit without telescopes. The star on the right side of the belt of Andromeda is not actually a star, as Al-Sufi originally thought, but is instead one of only two galaxies visible to the naked eye. He had recorded an observation of what we would later come to know of as the Andromeda Galaxy. All of these works would have a massive amount of influence on astronomy when they reached Europe centuries later for most people. They became widely disseminated during the Renaissance. One of Islam's most famous astronomers and scientific thinkers, Hassan ibn uh, al-Haytham, is now known as the father of optics because he was the first person to crack the code about how we perceive light. And he did that roughly a thousand years ago, sometime between 1010 and 1020 CE. He figured out the light traveled in a straight line into our eyes, but not out, which was a new idea. For hundreds of years, it was thought, uh, you know, by people like Ptolemy that our eyes actually emitted light, like an interior flashlight. I don't know how they didn't figure out, uh, you know, like uh, that that was wrong just based on (laughs) our eyes not glowing at night, but you know, whatever. Uh, This work would ultimately help develop the camera obscura and eventually aid in the invention of the telescope. And now let's head back to Europe. Born on February 19th, 1473 in Turin, Poland. Gross, I know, but I have accepted after learning a lot about Poland the last six or seven years that it is actually a place that is not only full of godless monsters and brain-dead goblins. It's not just my wife, Lindsay's ancestors. JK. Uh, But yeah, one of the good Polish people was Nicholas Copernicus. And he would bring Europe around to what Islamic scholars have been saying for centuries that the earth orbited the sun and not the other way around. Copernicus, you know, he worked uh, out a system in full mathematical detail, a system that proposed that the center of the universe was not the earth. He suggested that earth's rotation accounted for the rise and setting of the sun, the movement of the stars, and that seasons changed due to the earth's rotation around the sun. And finally, he correctly proposed that earth's motion through space caused the retrograde motion of the planets across the night sky. All of this made Copernicus the first person in recorded history to create a complete, general, and accurate systematic theory of the universe, combining mathematics, physics, and cosmology. 
Copernicus finished the first manuscript of his book where he broke all this down on the revolutions of heavenly spheres in 1532. Did not publish the book, however, until 1543, over a decade later, just two months before he died. And why? Well, he was scared, right? If you think the flat earth crowd is bad now, and they are, uh, they were so much worse back then. They were the majority, they were the people in power, and they would fucking have you killed for, you know, ideas they considered to be heresy. Uh, The church did not immediately condemn this book as heretical, however, Uh, perhaps because the printer also very likely worried about being burned alive or something terrible, uh, added a note that said, even though the book's theory was unusual, if it helped astronomers with their calculation, didn't matter if it wasn't really true, right? Little nod from the publisher to the Pope there. (laughs) We're just goofing around, Pope. Just having a little nerd fun with some math. Uh, This is just like a, it's just like a thought exercise. Copernicus is not actually saying that the earth is not the center of the universe, and the only thing that God cares about or that matters. No, 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 no. He's just, uh, he's just saying that if it was, it would be one way of explaining why the stars and planets and stuff move like they do. One of many ways. It, it's stupid. It's fucking stupid, really. Uh, thank you for being kind and gracious enough not to uh, have us killed. I'll, I'll show myself out. It probably also helped that the subject was so fucking difficult to understand that only very highly educated people today could even understand it. And because Europe had just begun to climb out of the dark ages from the previous century, there was uh, still a serious uh, shortage of, you know, really educated people in Europe. But those people did eventually figure out what old Capern dog was really saying. And then the Pope did ban the book in 1616. Nice. Oh, fuck yeah. Fuck signs. Uh, But thanks to the ongoing Protestant Reformation at this time, the Pope was not the only religious bigwig in Europe. There were others. And they also hated Copernicus's notions. Uh, Martin Luther described Copernicus as a moron, writing, This fool wishes to reverse the entire science of astronomy. But sacred scripture tells us that Joshua commanded the sun to stand still and not the earth. Well, there you go. If uh, Josh said it, uh, go fuck yourself, scientists. Doesn't matter what your telescopes and satellites say, right? Don't make fucking Josh look stupid. 1596. Johannes Kepler. A German teacher living in Graz wrote the first outspoken defense of the Copernican system, the Mysterium Cosmographicum. It's kind of a cool sounding book. Uh, he'd been born in Germany, sent to the Protestant seminary school in Malbronn, Malbronn to be educated for the clergy. Uh, while there, he kept having pesky thoughts about space, though. There were only six known planets in Kepler's time, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And Kepler wondered, well, why only six? Why not 20? Why not 100? You know, why did they have the spacing between their orbits that, Coper- that uh, Copernicus had deduced? No one had really been, uh, you know, asking such questions before, at least uh, really not publicly. Kepler's curiosity led him to move to Prague to work with the renowned Danish astronomer and huge fucking weirdo, uh, Tycho Brahe. He ended up inheriting Tycho's post as imperial mathematician in Prague when uh, Tycho died in 1601. Using the precise data that Tycho had collected, Kepler discovered that the orbit of Mars was an ellipse an imperfect circle like an oval. And yeah, Tico, that's, he's a whole other time suck someday. He's a, had some very interesting like pets and uh, possibly a very strange way of dying and just very eccentric guy. Uh, Kepler also correctly theorized that the rest of the universe was made up of the same old shit that Earth is. For centuries, philosophers had thought that planets were not made of regular old material, just stuff, but some sort of transcendent God substance. Kepler was one of the first people since antiquity to propose that the planets were material objects made of imperfect stuff, just like Earth. And if planets were imperfect, why not their orbits as well? In 1609, he published Astronom- Astronomia Nova, delineating his discoveries, which are now called Kepler's first two laws of planetary motion. All in all, he would provide three major laws describing how planetary bodies orbit the sun. One, planets move in elliptical orbits with the sun as a focus. Two, a planet covers the same area of space in the same amount of time, no matter where it is in its orbit. And his third law would come much later, laying out the clockwork of the solar system. He described it in a book called The Harmonies of the World. A planet's orbital period is proportional to the size of its orbit, its semi-major axis. The more distant a planet from the sun, the slower the planet takes to complete a full cycle around the sun. Like with Copernicus, Kepler's laws of planetary motion mark an important turning point in the transition from geocentrism to heliocentrism. They provide the first quantitative connection between the planets, including Earth, advancing the idea that the planets were not just random blobs out there, but that they uh, and our own planet work similarly. 
all rotating around the same sun in the same solar system. And with so much evidence to support his laws, Kepler's research shifted the scientific conversation from a binary argument about which system it really was to what kinds of evidence could exist to prove the heliocentric reality. Luckily, the political and religious climate where Kepler lived at that time was calm enough for him to just be denied the Lutheran sacrament and also the Catholic sacrament, actually, uh, but not persecuted much further than that. Simultaneously, someone in Italy was making big moves in an area not as tolerant as the Holy Roman Empire. Contrary to popular mythology, Galileo Galilei did not invent the telescope. A German-Dutch spectacle maker, Hans Lippershey, Hans, Hans Lippershey, where is your telescope? Uh, applied for, I don't know why I use that voice. That's not even close to German. <laughs> or you're Dutch. I forgot what fucking country Hans was. I just like his name, Lippershey. Anyway, that guy applied for the first patent in 1608. Uh, but he, uh, Galileo did significantly improve upon, uh, you know, this uh, patent, allowing humans to turn their sights to the cosmos far better than centuries before. And we don't know that old Lippershey actually built anything. Uh, Galileo would also become one of the major founders of modern science in the fields of physics, astronomy, cosmology, mathematics, also philosophy. He was a genius, a prolific visionary. Also had a pretty dumb name. <laughs> Why were his first and last names almost identical? But, you know, really cool dude. Uh, Galileo Galilei, eggplant parmigiana, Marissa Tomei, Antonio Banderas. Don't worry about it. I was born in Pisa in 1564, the first of six children of Vincenzo Galilei. Musician, scholar, bad name giver. In 1581, he entered the University of Pisa at age 16 to study medicine, but was soon sidetracked by mathematics. Must have been hard to be so smart in so many different ways, right? Constantly being distracted by all the other shit you're also really good at. Uh, he left without finishing his degree. In 1583, he made his first important discovery describing the rules that govern the motion of pendulums. From 1589 to 1610, Galileo was chair of mathematics at the universities of both Pisa and uh, Padua. During those years, he performed the experiments with falling bodies that made his most significant contribution to physics, proving that heavier objects don't actually fall faster than lighter objects, which was the belief commonly held since the days of Aristotle. It doesn't really seem correct, does it? I, I think I forgot. I don't know if I ever learned that one, but in my mind, until I came across that, I'm like, no, heavier stuff falls faster than light stuff, right? Like a part, a part of me doubted even at this after reading it. Right? I was like, no, that's not true. And I had to go watch a bunch of YouTube videos <laughs> for a second to realize, oh, okay. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, Galileo and all the modern legit scientists who understand physics uh, and gravity and shit are, are actually correct. Um, 1609, Galileo first learned of the existence of the spyglass, which excited him very much. He began to experiment with telescope making, going as far as to grind and polish his own lenses. This guy could do anything. Uh, when he was done, his handmade telescope allowed him to see with a magnification of eight or nine times, which was huge. In comparison, spy glasses of his day only provided a magnification of three. So this was a massive improvement. He was now literally seeing shit that no one, no human had ever seen before. Like how incredible that must have been. Uh, just like in more recent years, whenever a new telescope is built that is way more powerful than previous telescopes, what an amazing thing to be the first or one of the first people to see further out into the cosmos than literally anyone before. I think it was probably more amazing back in Galileo's day, you know, than it is now, because at least now astronomers, you know, they're fairly accurate in theorizing what's out there beyond what we can currently see. But back then they had no fucking clue, really. It was all so much more novel. Uh, his amazing invention allowed Galileo to be the first person to see craters on the moon, track the phases of Venus, see the rings of Saturn, and much more. Of all his telescope discoveries, he is perhaps most known for his discovery of the four massive moons of Jupiter, now known as the Galilean moons of Io, uh, Ganymede, Europa, and Callisto. Galileo may have also made the first recorded studies of the planet Neptune, though he didn't recognize it as a planet at that time. And all of that made Galileo the pride of Italy. I mean, parades were thrown for him. You know that old song? For he's a jolly good fellow. For he's a jolly good fellow. For he's a jolly good fellow. That nobody can deny. That nobody can deny. That nobody can deny. For he's a jolly good fellow. Like, that was written for him. In Italian, of course. Uh, the loose translation sounds like, Maserati Bugatti Spaghetti, Maserati Bugatti Spaghetti, Maserati Bugatti Spaghetti, Luigi Pizza Pie, Luigi Pizza Pie, Luigi Pizza Pie, Maserati Bugatti Spaghetti, Luigi Pizza Pie. 
Fucking masterclass. Nailed it. You get it. No, he wasn't celebrated for any of that shit. Uh, <laughs> so it's, a, it's the little things. It's the stupid things that make me laugh. Uh, his discovery actually made Galileo some very powerful enemies, of course. In his lifetime, all celestial bodies uh, were thought in where he lived uh, to orbit the earth. Well, pretty much everywhere they were thought that. Uh, supported by the Catholic Church, any teaching that ran against that system was declared heresy, right? You know, uh, in uh, 1615, mostly actually because of Galileo, uh, because of what he was saying, when first summoned to appear before a Roman Inquisition in 1616, Galileo was warned not to espouse heliocentrism as the truth. He was sternly warned. Then in 1616, thanks to more science nerds and smarty pants uh, types, you know, starting to think Galileo was really onto something, the church banned Nicholas Copernicus's book on the revolutions of the celestial spheres. Enough is enough, you fucking nerds. I am Pope, and truth is whatever I say it is. Like, it really was that kind of vibe. After a few minor edits, making sure that the sun theory was presented as purely hypothetical, the book was allowed to be published again in 1620 with the blessing of the church. But then, a few years later, they were like, just kidding. The new version banned, right? Best to not even speculate that Pope could be wrong. Then Galileo, that stupid fuck so dedicated to the truth, published Dialogue on the Two World Systems in 1632, a work to describe heliocentrism versus geocentrism. And the book clearly sided with heliocentrism and Pope not happy. Pope Urban VIII ordered another investigation against him. He was told that if he admitted to having gone too far in his treatment of heliocentrism, he'd be let off with a light punishment. Galileo agreed, not wanting to be, you know, tortured to death, and confessed that he did give stronger arguments to the heliocentric proponent in his dialogue than to the geocentric champion, and he was convicted of a strong suspicion of heresy, a lesser charge than actual heresy, never tortured, but ultimately uh, his book was banned and he was sentenced to penance and imprisonment. Uh, after a day in a real prison, his punishment was committed to villa arrest for the rest of his life. You know, not the worst way to go, considering he was already 17 and ill health, and then he would die in 1642. So he was forced to spend the last years of his life at home, uh, where he couldn't wander freely and share his truth with others. Uh, after he died, he became famous for his laws of motion, excuse me, uh, proven from his measurements that all bodies uh, accelerate at the same rate, regardless of their mass or size. Uh, something that would lay the foundation for modern physics as developed by Isaac Newton. Also, how crazy is this? It wasn't until 1744 when Galileo's dialogue was removed from the church's list of banned books. Uh, for fuck's sake. Uh, then Isaac Newton would expound on Galileo's ideas many years later, right? He was uh, not in the realm of the Pope and was able to get his hands on this book. Newton born on Christmas Day to a poor farming family in Woolstorp, England in 1642. Isaac Newton arrived in the world only a few months after his father, Isaac Newton Sr., had died. Everyone assumed young Isaac would follow in his father's footsteps and manage their small farm, and he would not. Sickly, feeling abandoned by his parents, quarrelsome, unsociable, and a virgin to the day he died. Crazy incel, Isaac Newton. Was a fucking weirdo. Uh, also, perhaps the greatest scientific genius who ever lived. Newton would go on to attend Trinity College in Cambridge, England. While there, he took an interest in mathematics, optics, physics, and astronomy. After graduating, he'd take a job teaching at his college, uh, was appointed the uh, second Lucian chair there, a position considered the most renowned academic chair in the world today, been occupied by legends like Charles Babbage and Stephen Hawking. One of uh, Newton's greatest achievements was calculating the universal law of gravitation. It's amazing what you can do if you just fucking never think about sex. Uh, he found that as two bodies move farther away from one another, the gravitational attraction between them decreases by the inverse of the square of the distance. Thus, if the objects are twice as far apart, the gravitational force is only a fourth as strong. If they are three times as far apart, it is only a ninth of its previous power. And that helps scientists understand far more about the motions of planets and of the moon around the Earth than ever before. Now, the regular orbits of the planets could be predicted and measured with great accuracy. And soon, Newton's friend, Edmund Halley, would discover how a certain comet seemed to appear at 76-year intervals. When he predicted correctly its return in 1758, it was named Halley's Comet after him posthumously. Uh, despite how correctly understanding a lot about celestial bodies, or despite, you know, now correctly understanding a lot about celestial bodies, we meet sex, uh, still had a lot of weird ideas. The Scottish philosopher David Hume toyed with the notion that comets were the reproductive cells, the fucking space jets, the eggs or sperm of planetary systems. 
and the planets were produced by some kind of interstellar sex, right? Just some big fucking space dragon shooting his comet space jizz across the galaxy. Maybe Nimrod and Lucifina fucking making planetary babies and uh, deal, whipping out <laughs> planetary facials. I don't know. Uh, sometimes I'm kind of bummed that we now know so much more than we did back then and can't realistically entertain these very entertaining ideas anymore, right? Not now, not now that we know the truth. It would be really fun to think that shit like that was still possible. At least we have aliens to still wonder about. Uh, others would, of course, keep pushing knowledge forward. Uh, in 1755, philosopher uh, Immanuel Kant asserted correctly that there were galaxies outside of the Milky Way. 1837, Frederick Bessel, Thomas Henderson, and Otto Struve measured the parallax of a few nearby stars. These were the first measurements of any distances outside our solar system. This also established the vast distance between stars and the true scope of the cosmos. Interestingly, just a few years later in 1848, a very unlikely source uh, made an interesting proposition. That was poet, writer, and former suck subject Edgar Allan Poe, who made the first correct solution that we know of to something called Albert's Paradox. The paradox can be stated pretty simply. Why is the night sky dark? The reason that this question is so important is because its answer can tell us about the distribution of stars and galaxies in the universe. I hadn't thought of this before, but actually, I think it's really cool. Consider the possibility that the universe is infinite and that it is filled with luminous objects, right? So many of them, objects full of light, like stars full of so much light, right? And, you know, on on the galaxies that contain them, there's so many of them. If this is true, then every sight line from the earth will eventually intersect a bright object. And that means that if the universe is infinite and contains an infinite number of bright objects, the night sky should be lit the fuck up constantly. An infinite number of the universe's most powerful lights surrounding us. Much like standing in a thick forest, if you look around, all you should see are trees. Johannes Kepler first posed this problem in 1610. He also suggested a solution. The universe of stars, he believed, extended only out to a finite distance. Once your line of sight passes that boundary, it encounters only empty space. But how far is that boundary? Why is it there? What lies beyond it? In 1823, the German astronomer, Heinrich Olbers suggested that starlight is gradually absorbed while traveling through space, and this cuts off the light from any stars beyond a sufficiently great distance. But that doesn't solve the problem either. If there are that many stars, a little dust would not absorb all that light that should be coming to us. After decades of astronomical speculation, the first scientifically reasonable answer was given in 1848, right, by the American poet Edgar Allan Poe. He suggested that the universe is not old enough to fill the sky with light. Right, The universe may be infinite in size, he thought, but there hasn't been enough time since the universe began for starlight, traveling at the speed of light, to reach us from the furthest research, uh, furthest reaches of space. Since then, astronomers have concluded that the universe began some 12 to 15 billion years ago. That means we can only see the part of it that lies within 12 to 15 billion light years from us. And of course, even if the universe were infinitely large and infinitely old, you still wouldn't see a wall of stars when you looked up at the night sky as stars stop shining and eventually die. Poe's theory suggested something so important that the universe has expanded. And that brings us to 1905. 1905, Albert Einstein. I've heard of him. That cousin fucker suggested the special theory of relativity. Like so many great game-changing ideas, it was not that well-received initially. It was, uh, you know, It was, and he was, either vehemently ridiculed or ignored. And a few times, gangs of other scientists would actually assault him. They were very aggressive about some things. They would tie him to a chair, and while he was defenseless, they would just, you know, pull his balls out of his pants. They would unzip his trousers, but not unbutton them to do that, and they would just, you know, zip his pants back up just enough so that, like, only his balls were hanging out, and then they would smack his balls with a little ping-pong paddle until he would cry, until he would weep. They wouldn't stop until he literally would say, I'm a stupid little mama's boy. My theories are trash. Thank you for the ball wax. I deserve it. He was humiliated. No, he was just annoyed because the uh, ball wax, of course, never happened. He was just ridiculed from afar or uh, ignored. Einstein actually wasn't happy with his theory either. It only acknowledged that time and space were uh, inextricably connected, but it didn't account for the existence of gravity. He revised it in 1915 to become the general theory of relativity. General relativity is basically Einstein's understanding of how gravity affects the fabric of space-time. As legend has it, it came from Einstein observing a window washer on a ladder near his patent office, and he imagined what would happen if he pushed that stupid motherfucker to the ground 
and then set him on fire and then pissed on him to put him out. Or he imagined what would happen if the worker just, you know, accidentally fell off. Instead of imagining the objective view, an image of someone falling, getting crushed by the ground and probably dying, he put himself in the window washer's perspective and imagined not what would happen if he met the ground, but what he would experience as he was falling. What he realized was that if he was falling, gravity would be the only force acting upon him. He would be accelerating towards the ground, but since no force would be emanating up from the ground, pushing against his body, he would feel no weight. With no wind resistance, he would be in free fall, and that would be no different than being weightless in space. So, acceleration and gravity were connected. But so what? Well, then Einstein imagined stepping on a bathroom scale. Say you weigh 200 pounds. Now imagine you do this in space, on a spaceship, accelerating in an upward direction 9.8 meters per second, which happens to be the exact same gravitational acceleration of Earth. Uh, Now, what would your weight be? It would still be 200 pounds. You wouldn't be able to tell if there weren't any windows if you were in space or on Earth. Or would you? Einstein thought about this and asked himself if there was a way to tell the difference. He imagined what would happen if he took a flashlight or a laser beam, pointed it from one side of the room to the other as the spaceship is accelerating upwards. If he had a sensitive enough measuring device, he could measure the height of the light on the other side of the room. And he realized through a whole bunch of furiously scribbled equations on notepads and chalkboards and shit that the height he would find on the other side would be slightly lower than the source of the light. Why? Because the floor of the room would be rushing upwards at ever faster speeds and the light would be propagating across the room. Since the room was accelerating upwards at 9.8 meters per second per second. Actually, I should have said, (laughs) I thought it was typo first, but I remember now it's like, it's a fucking crazy high math, the little concept here. Uh, The light beam would appear to curve downward. However, on Earth, the two measurements would indicate no difference. The light should go straight to the other side of the room. But that violated the principle of equivalence. Acceleration of the room on a spaceship should be no different than the room under the influence of gravity on Earth. He realized through these musings, and don't worry if you don't fully understand, I sure as shit don't because I'm nowhere near as smart as Einstein, that light must bend in the presence of a gravitational field. How could that be, though? Light ought to always take the shortest path between two points. It should go straight, right? Then he realized that maybe, just maybe, the light was taking the shortest path and that the shortest path was not straight. He wondered, perhaps gravity somehow uh, causes a curvature of space itself. Perhaps in the presence of mass and energy, space somehow becomes curved so the shortest path light could take was a curved path. Now, with the help of a mathematician named Marcel Grossman, uh, Einstein figured out the mathematics of curved space-time. And that would be the basis for general relativity. This was completely different from the commonly held scientific beliefs of the time. According to Newton's theories, time was fixed, space was fixed, and gravity was a mysterious force that could act at a distance from one massive object to another without touching it. In this new model, gravity didn't affect the underlying space or time, but acted within it. Einstein's, uh, or I'm sorry, in Newton's model. Einstein's theory, though, was that gravity was not a force between massive objects, but something that emerges from the interaction of space and massive objects. John Wheeler would later summarize the theory in 12 words. Space-time tells matter how to move. Matter tells space-time how to curve. And that's it. That's general relativity in a nutshell. Uh, So how the fuck does that nerd shit apply to our knowledge of the universe? Well, now the orbits of planets can be explained not by some mysterious force that acts at a distance, but rather an interaction that takes place locally with mass or energy and the space around it. However, in order to test this theory right for it to be really taken uh, seriously uh an observation needed to be made like like uh, you know have a prediction that could be tested uh that made uh the, that wouldn't make sense unless general relativity was true and that test came in the form of the planet mercury mercury's orbit had been a mystery for decades because it was well weird all planets orbited the sun in an ellipse the planet closest to the sun mercury orbited in an ellipse as well but it did also uh did something called a precession What that means is that the point of the orbit that is furthest from the sun advances a little bit every time Mercury goes around the sun. Newtonian physics just didn't quite explain that. But Einstein now did. When Einstein applied his new curved space theory to this orbit, the new theory precisely predicted the precession of Mercury. Finally, a theory perfectly matched an observation, which had been a mystery for decades. But what about Einstein's concept of space-time? What does that mean? That's where special relativity comes in. The essential presumption in special relativity is that light always moves at the same speed regardless of perspective or reference frame. It'll have the same speed in an accelerating reference frame and in a resting 
reference frame. If this is the case, then it means that the speed of light in the presence of gravity will be the same as its speed in empty space. But since the distance traveled by the beam of light in a gravitational field is longer due to the curving of space, in order for the speed of light to remain constant, time itself must pass slower in the gravitational field relative to time in empty space. Hard to wrap your noodle around? Yeah, me too. Uh, thinking about this, I kept picturing a little uh, mind-blown emoji. Just a uh, Explained another way. Time increases proportionally with the curvature of space near a gravitational field compared to empty space to keep the speed of light constant in both reference frames. So time, just like space, is distorted by gravity. Isn't that fucking wild? Time is distorted. And that gives us what we call the fabric of space-time. And this has massive implications. It implies that an observer experiencing no gravity will see the clock in a gravitational field running slower. This means that the clocks on Earth run slightly slower than clocks on the International Space Station. How fucking trippy is that concept? Technically, astronauts on the International Space Station age a tiny bit more slowly than us meat sacks down here on the Earth's surface. Not much. Every six months, they've aged 0.007 seconds less than us. Uh, This effect has been confirmed by many experiments and is taken into account in order to keep the clocks of GPS satellites in sync with clocks on Earth. Otherwise, apps like Google Maps eventually would give you slightly inaccurate locations. Uh, This theory also predicts that in certain uh, regions of space, space space-time can get so distorted that nothing escapes, not even light. And this Lovecraftian horror is the reality of a black hole. Einstein's theory uh, theory shows that within these black holes lies something that seems impossible. And that is a mass concentrated to an infinitely small point with infinite density, a place where general relativity fails. And we'll talk about this more in a bit. But there are theories that when you get near a black hole, one year there would actually be like, you know, 80 years back on Earth. You could in some crazy, very theoretical, who knows if we'll ever have the tech to test this uh, way, you know, quickly beam beam over to the edge of a black hole, stay there a few years, then come back to Earth and it would just be centuries later. Right Again, the mind-blown emoji. No one for sure knows what happens in a black hole, but again, in some crazy new reality where we could figure out how to enter a black hole and not die, then re-emerge, you could have spent, you know, what was an hour inside the black hole. But thousands of years could have passed outside of it. That's how much these things are thought to fuck with the fabric of space-time. Very sci-fi. Well, you know, maybe sci-fact, maybe. Uh, Currently thought that there is no chance of someone entering a black hole and doing anything but dying, though. Uh, Back now to the early 20th century. We'll get into black holes more in a bit. After Einstein's big breakthrough with space-time, a lot more discoveries would come in quick succession. Edwin Hubble, in 1923, definitively demonstrated that our universe much larger than anyone else previously thought. Earth, our solar system, the Milky Way, none of those were the center of the universe, but one small part of it. Beyond our limited frame of reference was the Andromeda Galaxy, a Triangulum Galaxy, NCG 6822 uh, Galaxy, just to name a few. In 1929, Edwin Hubble would also discover something called the linear redshift distance relation. Uh, That is the discovery of an expanding universe, a universe that has been expanding since the Big Bang. Uh, This would be the foundation for George Gamow's 1946 theory of the hot Big Bang that predicted the existence of a very hot cosmic radiation field, uh, you know, that led the scientific community to believe that all of the chemical elements in the universe were formed in the hot Big Bang. But it wouldn't be until 1949 that Fred Hoyle would coin the term Big Bang. And he didn't mean it positively. A British scientist, he was a proponent of the steady state model, a universe created by a steady expansion due to a constant creation of matter and not all matter created by some instant flashpoint. Freddie coined the term Big Bang on BBC Radio's third program broadcast on March 28, 1949. Hoyle would explicitly deny that he was trying to be insulting, saying that he was just trying to explain the difference between the two theories Uh, But the vibe was very much of, uh, what do you mean the universe just popped into existence? Like some kind of big bang? You shit me? Get the fuck out of here. A couple years later, 1957, scientists Margaret Burbage, Jeffrey Burbage, William Fowler, and also Fred Hoyle published a landmark paper in which they described how all elements heavier than lithium are synthesized by nuclear processes in the cores of stars, which means everyone alive today, we're all stardust. Which, uh, you know, at the very least, is some pretty cool shit to say. Okay, any more notable discoveries we'll cover that'll help us understand the nature of our universe? Uh, Let's go over them as we describe some massive space objects like black fucking holes after our timeline. 
Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. Let's dig in more to this Big Bang. Uh, the Big Bang Theory, uh, currently in the scientific world, the leading explanation for how the universe began. Simply put, it says that the universe as we know it started with an infinitely hot and dense single point that inflated and stretched first at truly unimaginable speeds and then at more measurable speeds over the next 13.7 billion years to the still expanding cosmos that we know today. Uh, existing technology doesn't yet allow astronomers to literally peer back at the universe's birth. Most of what we understand about the Big Bang comes from mathematical formulas and models. Astronomers can, however, see what they believe to be the echo of the expansion through a phenomenon known as the cosmic microwave background, leftover radiation from the Big Bang, which was discovered by accident in 1965, when two researchers with Bell Telephone Laboratories, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, oh, Bobby Dub, uh, were creating a radio receiver and were puzzled by the noise it was picking up. They soon realized that noise came uniformly from all over the sky. At the same time, a team at Princeton University led by Robert Dickey, oh, Bobby Dickey, fuck yeah, if we can't have a Richard, Dickey, not a bad constellation prize. Uh, and these dudes were trying to find the CMB. And then Dickey's team got wind of the Bell experiment and realized, oh, that's the CMB they're hearing, right? The CMB had just been found. CMB thought to date to about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. In the immediate moment afterwards, explosive expansion began ballooning our universe outwards much faster than the speed of light. There was a period of cosmic inflation that lasted mere fractions of a second, according to physicist Alan Goose's 1980 theory. When cosmic inflation came to a sudden and still mysterious end, the more classic descriptions of the Big Bang took hold. A flood of matter and radiation, known as reheating, began uh, populating our universe with stuff we know today, uh, particles, atoms, stuff that would become stars and galaxies and so on. This all happened within just the first second, after the universe began, when the temperature of everything was still insanely hot, somewhere around 10 billion degrees Fahrenheit, <laughs> Five and a half billion degrees Celsius. That's a fucking ridiculous set of numbers. Uh, you would be nearly, in, like near instantaneously vaporized at that temperature. Not even ash would remain, right? The carbon in your body would sublimate, just turned into gas. You'd be reduced to invisible atoms. If I ever find the lost wizard scrolls from the ancient library of Alexandria that we talked about a few weeks ago, the ones that supposedly teach you, according to at least one person on YouTube, how to shoot fireballs. That's how hot my fireballs are going to be. Yeah, I said it. You better watch your fucking ass if I find those fireball wizard scrolls. Because I'm not just going to shoot regular old magic fireballs that are like campfire hot. I'm going to ratchet it up to big bang hot. And I'm going to vaporize anyone who gives me a problem. And honestly, probably just some people who I don't care for for whatever reason. With some big bang wizard fireballs. Which sounds like a great name for a very explosive drink. Have you cracked open a can of Whipple? Big Bang Wizard Fireballs Edition? When was the last time you drank some dark matter? Or how about some antimatter? When was the last time you poured a liquid black hole down your stupid pie hole? Do you want to just stroll through your monotonous humdrum life here on only Earth? Or do you want to blow the fuck up and create an entirely new universe of possibilities with some Whipple? Big Bang Wizard Fireballs Edition. Every fucking 144 ounce can is loaded with the tastiest, most explosive primordial soup. Quarks, neutrons, electrons, space dust, comets, supernova explosions, space fire, uh, proto star juice, dwarf star juice, red giant star juice, and pulp, uh, gamma rays, more space fire, wormholes, black hole gravity, so much fucking fire, hot dog water for flavor, and a dozen or so ghost peppers and five or six Carolina Reapers for a little extra kick. So fuck you, fuck your family, and drink Whipple! Big Bang Wizard Fireballs Edition, the official drink for all intergalactic and interstellar travel, and a proud subsidiary of Bear Evil Incorporated. That sounds like a really powerful energy drink. I mean, something that could seriously take your shit to the next level. Anyway, uh, back to stuff that exists outside the suckers. Back to Big Bang doing some big banging. Sounds like the name of a porno. Uh, the Cosmos. Thanks to this hot, hard, dripping with radiation, father, daddy, big bang energy. Uh, now contained a vast array of fundamental particles, such as neutrons, electrons, and protons. The raw materials that would become the building blocks for literally everything that exists today. This early primordial celestial soup would have been impossible to actually see because it couldn't hold visible light. 
The free electrons would have caused light, photons, to scatter the way sunlight scatters from the water droplets in a cloud. Over time, however, these free electrons met up with nuclei and created neutral atoms or atoms with equal positive and negative electric charges. This was light and the beginnings of the CMB, the cosmic microwave background. Uh, that's how many think the universe, you know, got started. While the Big Bang is only a theory, it is the strongest theory we have about the creation of the universe, according to the majority of the members of the global scientific community. Every test we throw at it comes back in support of the theory. But scientists can only say the, that the evidence supports a theory with some degree of confidence, always less than 100%. Uh, the three most important observations scientists have made that support the Big Bang theory uh, are, one, the Hubble Law shows that distant objects are receding from us at a rate proportional to their distance, which occurs when there is uniform expansion in all directions. This implies a history where everything was once very close together. Uh, two, the properties of the cosmic microwave background radiation. This shows that the universe went through a transition from an ionized gas, a plasma, and a neutral gas. Such a transition implies a hot, dense early universe that cooled as it expanded. The relative abundances of light elements is three. That's number three here. Their abundances show that the universe was once really hot and really dense. Okay, now let's look at how stars are formed, which will lead directly to how black holes are formed. Uh, present observation suggests that the first stars formed from clouds of gas around 150 to 200 million years after the Big Bang. Stars are the most widely recognized astronomical objects represent the most fundamental building blocks of galaxies. Stars are believed to have been born within the clouds of dust and scattered throughout most galaxies. Turbulence deep within these clouds gives rise to knots with sufficient mass that the gas and dust can begin to collapse under its own gravitational attraction. As the cloud collapses, the material at the center begins to heat up. Known as a protostar, it is this hot core at the heart of the collapsing cloud that will one day become a star. Anyone else think protostar sounds a lot like porn star? And did you also imagine for a second a massive universe full of porn stars dreamed of becoming regular stars? Like the sun starts off as Riley Reed, then transforms into Jennifer Lawrence or something. Anyway, three-dimensional computer models of star formation uh, predict that the spinning clouds of collapsing gas and dust may break up into two or three, well, I don't know, star blobs. That would explain why they're, you know, the majority of stars in the Milky Way are, are paired or in groups of multiple stars. As the cloud collapses, a dense, hot core forms and begins gathering dust and gas. Not all this material ends up as part of a star. The remaining dust can become planets, asteroids, or comets, or may remain a stardust. When the dust does coalesce into a star, it performs some pretty important functions. Stars are responsible for the manufacture and distribution of heavy elements, such as carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And their characteristics are intimately tied to the characteristics of the planetary systems that may coalesce about them. These elements get catapulted through the universe in spectacular stellar explosions called supernovas. Uh, anyone else love the word supernova? Before I even knew what it meant, I loved it. It just sounds cool. Probably one of my favorite words, supernova. Also, as a big Oasis fan, when I was younger, Champagne Supernova may be one of the best song titles ever. Uh, back to what stars do, producing heavy elements and such. One star that produces a fuck ton of helium is our own star, the sun, which came from a dust cloud that collapsed about 4.5 billion years ago. From this collapse, dust and gas began to collect into denser regions. As the regions pulled in more matter, conservation of angular momentum caused it to begin rotating while increasing pressure caused it to heat up. Most of the material ended up in a ball at the center while the rest of the matter flattened out into a disk that circled around it. The ball at the center would eventually form the sun while the disk of material would form the planets. The sun spent about 100,000 years as a collapsing protostar before temperatures and pressures in the interior ignited fusion at its core. Just a few million years later, it settled down into its current form, and then our sun will stay in this mature phase for about 10 billion years, a medium-sized yellow dwarf star about 93 million miles from Earth. There are many other stars that are both bigger and smaller than our sun. The most massive stars, known as hypergiants, may be 100 or more times more massive than our sun and have surface temperatures of more than 30,000 kelvins, <laughs> roughly uh, 53,540 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, vaporizing temperature, right? When you are completely fucking erased into invisible to the naked eye particles, which I will fucking do to you with my wizard fireballs. If I find those scrolls. Hypergiants have bit hundreds of thousands of times more energy than the sun, but have lifetimes of only a few million years. The smallest stars, known as red dwarfs, 
may contain as little as 10% of the mass of the sun, emit only 0.01% as much energy. Fucking like little fucking weak ass, fucking little tiny red dwarf, you know. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to think of little geometro stars. Uh, despite their diminutive nature, red dwarfs are by far the most numerous stars in the universe have uh, lifespans of tens of billions of years. In general, kind of like with dogs, and I guess humans to an extent, larger the star, shorter the life. Once a star is fused, all the hydrogen in its core and nuclear reactions cease. Deprived of the energy production needed to support it, the core begins to collapse into itself and it becomes much hotter. Hydrogen is still available outside the core, so hydrogen fusion continues in a shell surrounding the core. The increasingly hot core also pushes the outer layers of the star outward, causing them to expand and cool, transforming the star into a red giant. If the star is sufficiently massive, the collapsing core may become hot enough to support more exotic nuclear reactions that consume helium and produce a variety of heavier elements up to iron. However, such reactions offer only a temporary reprieve. Gradually, the star's internal nuclear fires become increasingly unstable, sometimes burning furiously, other times dying down. These variations cause the star to pulsate, throw off its outer layers, and shrouding itself in a cocoon of gas and dust. What happens next depends on the size of the core. For average stars like our sun, the process of ejecting its outer layers continues until the stellar core is exposed. This dead, but still ferociously hot stellar cinder is called a white dwarf. White dwarfs, which are roughly the size of our Earth, despite containing the mass of a star, once puzzled astronomers, why did they, did they not collapse further? What force supports the mass of the core? Quantum mechanics would provide the ex explanation. Pressure from fast-moving electrons keeps these stars from collapsing. The more massive the core, the denser the white dwarf that is formed. Thus, the smaller a white dwarf is in diameter, the larger it is in mass. Which I know is paradoxical. Uh, paradoxical. Uh, these paradoxical stars are uh, very common. Our own sun will be a white dwarf billions of years from now. White dwarfs are intrinsically very faint because they are so small and lacking a source of energy production. They fade into oblivion as they gradually cool down. If a white dwarf forms in a binary or multiple star system, it may experience a more eventful demise as a nova. Nova, Latin for new. Nova, once thought to be new stars. Uh, today, we understand that they are, in fact, very old stars, the white dwarfs. If a white dwarf is close enough to be a companion star or to a companion star, its gravity may drag matter, mostly hydrogen, from the outer layers of that star onto itself, building up its surface layer. When enough hydrogen has accumulated on the surface, a burst of nuclear fusion occurs, causing the white dwarf to brighten substantially and expel the remaining material. Within a few days, the glow subsides and the cycle starts again. Sometimes particularly massive white dwarfs may accrete so much mass that they collapse and explode completely, and that is a supernova. Fuck yeah, bro. Someday you will find me caught beneath the landslide. Of a champagne supernova, a champagne supernova in the sky. It sounds, it sounds a lot better when they sing it. A supernova, not merely a bigger nova. In a nova, only the star's surface explodes. In a supernova, the star's core collapses and then explodes. This is because a complex series of nuclear reactions leads to the production of iron in the core. And this fusion takes so much energy that the star no longer has any way to support its own mass. And the iron core collapses. In just a matter of seconds, the core shrinks from roughly 5,000 miles across to just a dozen, and the temperature spikes 100 billion degrees or more. Sounds pretty hot. Uh, the outer layers of the star initially begin to collapse along with the core, but rebound with the enormous release of energy and are thrown violently outward. Supernovas release an almost unimaginable amount of energy. For a period of days to weeks, a supernova may outshine an entire galaxy. Likewise, all the naturally occurring elements and a rich array of subatomic particles are produced in these explosions. On average, a supernova explosion occurs about once every 100 years in the typical galaxy. About 25 to 50 supernova are discovered each year in other galaxies, but most too far away to be seen without a telescope. Uh, but with smaller stars, the collapse continues until electrons and protons combine to form neutrons, producing a neutron star. Because it contains so much mass packed into such a small volume, the gravitation at the surface of a neutron star is immense. Neutron stars have powerful magnetic fields, which can accelerate atomic particles around its magnetic poles, producing powerful beams of radiation. These beams sweep around like massive searchlight beams as the star rotates. If such a beam is oriented so that it periodically points towards Earth, we can observe it as a regular pulse of radiation. In this case, a neutron star is known as a pulsar. 
But when a star that's super big collapses, that's when we get a black hole. And now another song pops into my head, right? Also was a huge Soundgarden fan. One of their biggest hits, Black Hole Sun. Black Hole Sun, won't you come and wash away the rain? I'm not even trying to do any more uh, Chris Cornell. One of the best voices ever. Uh, but scientists think that the first black holes formed back when the universe first began. Not with the collapse of stars, but with the direct collapse of gas, a process that is expected to result in more massive black holes with a mass ranging from 1,000 times the mass of the sun to 100,000 times the mass of the sun. Theoretically, there are different kinds of black holes out there and lots of them, which is pretty creepy. Uh, back to stellar black holes, they're made when the center of a very big star falls in upon itself or collapses. And unlike dwarfs, supernovas, or other stars that will eventually time out, nothing can stop the crushing collapse of a really massive star. In our Milky Way alone, there are an estimated 10 million to 1 billion stellar black holes. That sounds like a lot, until you consider that there are an estimated 100 to 400 billion stars in our galaxy. There are also thought to be supermassive black holes, which weigh in at millions to billions of times the mass of the sun. These gravitational goliaths reside in the center of most, if not all, galaxies, theoretically. None of this is really making me want to live out some kind of Star Trek fantasy right now. Uh, space sounds scary as hell. Uh, Sagittarius A star is the supermassive black hole believed to lie at the heart of our Milky Way galaxy. Believed to be around 44 million kilometers or over 27 million miles across, containing approximately 4.31 uh, million solar masses. And that means it would be, you know, 4.31 million times as big as our sun. Like it would contain 4.31 million suns. The biggest, scariest monster in our galaxy. Uh, Nimrod, not scared of it though. Uh, some theorize that our suck for his creator, Nimrod, created these supermassive black holes to be his personal interstellar porta potties, right? He didn't want his massive space shits to pollute the universe. So he created huge black holes for huge poops. He didn't want to ever worry about them filling up or getting clogged. It's just a theory, you know, anyone can postulate a theory, including me, even one that's terrible like that one. Uh, this big-ass mysterious monster was discovered in 1974 by two astronomers, Bruce Balick and Bobby Brown. Not the one with the headset, singing about his prerogative. Bobby L. Brown. Uh, Sagittarius A star is actually relatively small compared to supermassive black holes found in some other galaxies. For example, the black hole at the center of galaxy Holmberg 15A supposedly holds at least 40 billion solar masses. Nearly 10 times as big as Sagittarius A star. Now let's talk about the structure, shape of black holes and how they might move through space. We'll start with structure. At the center of a black hole lies what's called the singularity. This is such a fast, maybe the most fascinating fucking concept ever. It is a theoretical point in space which has zero volume but contains all of an object's mass. Uh, it's, you know, uh, here where the black hole truly lives. Encapsulating the singularity lies what most people picture when they think of a black hole, the event horizon. This is the spherical boundary beyond which nothing, not even light, can escape a black hole's clutches. The ultimate no man's land, a place where matter is compressed down to an infinitely tiny point and all conceptions of time and space completely break down. If you're having a hard time understanding this concept, don't worry about it. It's only because you're stupid. Like you're fucking really stupid. I get it completely. I, I, don't, even, I don't even need to go scribble on a chalkboard to get it. It just makes like intrinsical sense. To not stupid, I don't get it, but it sounds, but I, I get enough to understand that it's cool. Uh, ravenous black holes consume anything that gets too close, right? That goes beyond the event horizon. But around the event horizon is an area similar to an overflowing dinner plate where the excess matter that, you know, they've seized creates a hot swirling pool of fucking doom called an accretion disk. And this disk pulverizes everything within it from gas to dust to asteroids to planets and then that material continues to circle deeper and deeper into the gravity monster of the black hole until it just eventually is gobbled up completely. Because the dense rings of material can race around black holes at significant fractions of the speed of light, they get so hot that they emit x-rays, giving away the black hole's position. This was the way that the first image of a black hole was captured in 2019 by the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. The image shows a bright ring around a black hole 6.5 billion times more massive than the sun. 55 million light years from Earth. This halo is actually a visual, visualization of the heat given out by hot gas swirling around the event horizon, the very edge of the black hole, as it's being pulled in. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to see black holes because light can't escape their gravitational pull. 
Uh, another way scientists see black holes is a kind of bouncy ball effect. Sometimes as matter is drawn towards a black hole, it ricochets off the event horizon and it's hurled outward rather than being tugged into the center. Bright jets of material traveling at near relativ- relativistic speeds are created. Although the black hole remains unseen, the powerful jets can be viewed from a great distance. So are black holes something we should be worrying about? Uh, Yeah. A lot of the smaller ones can zip around the galaxy at speeds faster than the speed of light. And those ones don't have rings we can see. And theoretically, one could arrive in our solar system at any moment and literally pulverize everything inside it into nothing. And that can happen right now. That can happen tonight, right after you go to sleep. They can happen right like when you're like one day away from retirement. That's when it's probably going to happen. Or maybe just like seconds before the threesome you've been waiting for your entire adult life. It's about to kick off. No, we're safe. We're safe from black holes. So much other shit to worry about if you want to just focus on doom. But uh, you don't have to worry about black holes. The nearest known black hole is Gaia BH1. It's uh, 1,560 light years from Earth. For comparison, the nearest star to our sun, about 4.24 light years away. Even if you could hop aboard a spaceship traveling five miles a second, like the kind NASA has used to orbit the Earth, it would take about 37,200 years to go one light year. So it would take over 58 billion years <laughs> traveling at five miles a second to make it to Gaia BH1. So Gaia BH1 can go fuck itself. I ain't scared. Uh, for a black hole to have an actual effect on us, it would have to be uh, no farther than a million light year away. But what would happen if a black hole got close enough to harm us? Well, according to Dr. Phil Platt, a.k.a. the bad astronomer, who gets his name from pointing out bad astronomy in movies and TV. So if we pretend that this will happen, and again, probably not. But if, we, but if it were to happen, your typical black hole, which is 10 or 20 times the mass of the sun, is very small. It's only a few dozen miles across, and it's black, so it doesn't emit light, and it's just out there in space. We won't see it. Now, it may have some effect on starlight. Starlight passes it. It gets bent and warped, and we might notice that, and that would be pretty cool, although terrifying. But the effect it would have gravitationally on us would first probably be with outer planets, or even those chunks of ice and rock that orbit the sun, even out past Neptune. These are like giant comets and the gravity of the black hole would probably disturb those. And we see these things falling in towards the sun and think, wow, we're getting a lot of comets lately. What's going on with that? Oh, maybe it's a black hole. And then as it gets closer, the orbits of the planets would change. And we'd see that because we know how the planets go around the sun. And then if it got close enough to Earth, that would be bad. The moon might get pulled out of its orbit. And then there are the tides. Gravity changes with distance. The closer you are to something, the stronger the gravity. And if one side of Earth is closer to the black hole than the other side, that means that there's a different force on the two sides of the Earth. And that will stretch us like an egg. And if the black hole gets close enough, it will tear the Earth apart. That would really suck if the Earth got torn apart. Our atmosphere uh, would be no longer bound by our gravity. The Earth's molten core would be exposed to the vacuum of space, resulting in massive earthquakes global-wide, you know, or what's left of the globe. Chunks of Earth, no longer symmetrical and held that shape by gravity. They would start to collapse in on themselves, right? There would be crazy flooding, insane heat. Uh, Who knows how long this hellscape might last? Probably not very long. And it would be a total nightmare and everyone would die. There is actually a scenario that could allow for a black hole to sneak into our solar system without us dying, though. But like a little black hole. Bigger than a butthole, black hole. And for sure more powerful than a butthole, but not as big or powerful as a supermassive, world-destroying kind of fucking Thanos-type black hole. And in fact, that may have already happened. Right after the Big Bang, with matter kind of flowing around uh, evenly, collapsing into stars and planets, there were still some regions that happened to be especially dense. And the collapses created, and you know, some collapses created what are known as primordial black holes. And these could have been 100,000 times smaller than a paperclip. And they might have been created in such numbers that they could account for 86% of the universe. The idea of such tiny black holes intrigued astrophysicist uh, Stephen Hawking, who explored their quantum mechanical properties. That work led to his 1974 discovery that black holes can evaporate over time. Hawking calculated that any primordial black hole with a mass greater than 1,012 pounds, it's a very specific number, uh, could still be around today, while those less massive would have already disappeared. One theory is that these primordial black holes are actually dark matter. Something we'll talk about here in a bit and something that's puzzled scientists for decades. About 45% of our solar system is thought to be made up currently of dark matter. So if black holes are dark matter, it's possible that we have primordial black holes in our solar system and many of them. 
even crazier, primordial black holes could actually hit Earth. If one did it, theoretically, would uh, not just impact like an asteroid. It would pass straight through the entire Earth and exit the other side. And maybe craziest of all, that may have already happened. Though the planet would hardly feel it, uh, locally it could be catastrophic. As the black hole entered the atmosphere, let's say it's the size of a large asteroid, the event horizon would start to accelerate matter to incredible speeds. Particles would collide with each other that generate insanely high temperatures, temperatures hotter than a star. And the primordial black hole could only take in so much before the radiation created by the colliding particles pushes it back. It would end up looking like the brightest shooting star you've ever seen, crashing through the atmosphere, emitting a blast, then tunneling through the planet. This description not so different than the uh, Tunguska event of 1908. During this event that occurred in Siberia, estimated that an asteroid entered Earth's atmosphere traveling at a speed of about uh, 33,500 miles an hour. During this quick plunge, the 220 million pound space rock heated the air surrounding it to 44,500 degrees Fahrenheit. At 7.17 a.m. local Siberia time, at a height of about 28,000 feet, they think, the combination of pressure and heat caused the asteroid to fragment and annihilate itself, producing a massive fireball and releasing energy equivalent to about 185 times the power of the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. But it did not leave a crater. The explosion flattened about 80 million trees over an area of 2,000 square kilometers or 1,200 square miles, wounded around 1,500 people, but did not leave a crater. Well, why is that? Some people say it's because the asteroid exploded in the atmosphere, exploded in the atmosphere. Others say it's because it was never an asteroid. It was a black hole. Some scientists have pointed out a few, no pun intended, holes in that theory, like the fact that if the black hole would have shot straight through the Earth, the exit point, latitude 40 degrees, 50 minutes north, longitude 30 degrees, 40 minutes west, would be in the mid-Atlantic, and it would be marked by an equally severe shock and blast wave, but it was not. However, since that was in the middle of the fucking ocean, we may not have noticed. So, sounds like overall, we, and by uh, we, I mean all of us on Earth, kicked the shit out of that black hole! So I say, bring on more black holes, space dragons! We'll kick your fucking black hole asses! Had to really make sure I added the word holes, following black with all that. Very different vibe, if I had not done that. Uh, at the lowest possible mass for a primordial black hole, it's believed that one passing through the Earth would create a magnitude 4 earthquake all across the Earth's surface. Uh, since that didn't happen back in 1908, you know, maybe maybe we did not defeat a black hole, but still very fascinating to think about. Uh, let's now look at another black hole hypothetical. What would happen if one of us meets Zach somehow got sucked into a black hole, like a big one, like Sagittarius A-star? If you fell into a supermassive black hole, scientists have long theorized that the intense gravity would stretch you out kind of like a spaghetti noodle in a process literally known as spaghettification. <laughs> Somebody had a big shitty eating grin when they coined that little fun term. Uh, the black hole's gravity force would compress you from top to toe while stretching you at the same time, thus kind of turning you into a stretched out form, kind of like how you would make a spaghetti noodle. Or it would be even worse than that. A 2012 study published in the journal Nature suggested that quantum effects would cause the event horizon to act much like a wall of fire and you would instantly be burned to death. Is that worse than being turned into a human spaghetti noodle? I don't think so, actually. Like, if I had to pick between getting tossed into some ring of space fire and just immediately vaporized or stretched out like a noodle, just fucking burn me already. Sounds way less painful. But let's suppose you don't choose that, uh, that death. What would your final moments really look like? Assuming, of course, you could somehow breathe out in space, also survive insane amounts of radiation, extreme heat or extreme cold, lack of atmospheric pressure that would lead to all sorts of horrible shit. Your journey into Sagittarius A-star itself would begin after you slip over the event horizon, the point of no return. You would be able to see out from the inside, but weirdly, no one outside would be able to see you because light is falling back onto you, thanks again to intense gravitational forces. The good news is that although the gravitational pull is much stronger than in smaller black holes, the stretching tidal force is less, meaning, according to a lot of scientists in recent years, uh, you wouldn't necessarily be turned into spaghetti. You could theoretically survive if you wore some crazy spacesuit for, for at least many hours, right? What a weird way to die. Eventually, as you approach the black hole center, the gravitational forces would become strong enough to, you know, spaghettify you and tear you apart. Uh, that would happen before you reach the singularity, unfortunately. This magical place at the center of a black hole 
where matter is compressed to an infinitely tiny point, right? We mentioned that earlier. And all, you know, uh, conceptions of time and space completely break down. So it's a bummer you couldn't make it that far. Sounds like that would be a super fucking cool place to be. That you could, you know, exist outside of space and time. Which I kind of did when I smoked some toad venom. Uh, But, you know, I was really just laying on a friend's sofa. And not really outside the boundaries of space and time. But it felt like it. My brain was just dealing with some uh, strange chemicals. What would actually happen if you could reach the singularity and somehow not die? For many years, scientists and science fiction writers theorized that there could be a way out of a black hole. That if you could reach the center, right? If you could reach the singularity, it could spit you out, uh, spit you out somewhere else. You know, you could be in a wormhole or a white hole, some Star Trek shit. Uh, today, we know that wormholes and black holes are different. Uh, a wormhole is a funnel-shaped space-time tunnel between two points between universes, whereas a black hole is a cosmic body with an extreme gravity from which nothing can escape. Another major difference between a black hole and a wormhole is that a black hole has solid proof of evidence of its existence in space, whereas scientists are yet to discover a concrete piece of evidence for wormholes' existence. You know, bummer. Uh, that's why wormholes are mostly referred to with the phrase wormhole theory. Wormholes were first theorized about 1916, though they weren't called that at that time. While reviewing another physicist's solution to the equations in Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity, Austrian physicist Ludwig Flamm realized another solution was possible. He described a white hole, a theoretical time reversal of a black hole. And he theorized that entrances to both black and white holes... <laughs> it sounds, sorry, my brain went to like... It feels like I'm fucking narrating a weird space porn right now. Entrances to both black and white holes uh, could be connected by a huge cock or a space-time conduit. 1935, Einstein and physicist Nathan Rosen used the theory of relativity to elaborate on this idea, proposing the existence of bridges through space-time. These bridges would connect two different points in space-time, theoretically creating a shortcut that could reduce travel time and distance. The shortcuts came to be known as Einstein-Rosen bridges or wormholes. So, uh, very sweet concept for sci-fi. And, uh, you know, all of this sci-fact, or at least sci-theory, has influenced the world of sci-fi so much. Franchises like Star Wars, Star Trek, Guardians of the Galaxy, and more, you know, they look very different if not for all these concepts that curious authors, uh, you know, uh, played with to build new worlds where spaceships can do shit like hyperwarp through wormholes to reach distant points and galaxies almost instantly. These theoretical wormholes, if they exist, obviously, would contain two mouths with a so-called throat connecting the two, according to an article published in the Journal of High Energy Physics in 2020. The mouse would most likely be, you know, uh, spheroidal in shape, while the throat might be a straight stretch, but it could also wind around like one of those big bendy twirly straws from a silly cocktail in the, in the 80s. So could you travel through a wormhole if they exist? Maybe. There are some theoretical problems. The first problem is size. Primordial wormholes predicted to exist on microscopic levels. However, as the universe expanded, it's possible that some may have been stretched to larger sizes big enough for a spaceship. Another problem comes from stability. Uh, the wormholes that Einstein and uh, Rosen or Rosen predicted would be useless for travel because they collapsed quickly. You would need to introduce some exotic matter in order to stabilize the wormhole. And recent research has found that a wormhole containing exotic matter could stay open and unchanging for longer periods of time. Uh, exotic matter, which should not be confused with dark matter or antimatter, contains negative energy density and a large negative pressure. Such matter has only been seen in the behavior of certain vacuum states as part of quantum field theory. Even if we did have this exotic matter, it would be a lot easier to send information or messages through wormholes than people. The jury is not in, so we just don't know. Physicist Kip Thorne, one of the world's leading authorities on relativity, black holes, and wormholes, says, continuing with, but there are very strong indications that wormholes that a human could travel through are forbidden by the laws of physics. That's sad, that's unfortunate, but that's the direction in which things are pointing. And to that, I say, shut the fuck up, Kip, you fun-hating nerd! You don't know, not for sure! You've never been in space! Stop trying to ruin uh, cool comic books and movies, you dick! Uh, I mentioned dark matter and antimatter. What are those? Well, dark matter makes up, again, of course, theoretically, uh, over 80% of all matter in the universe. Uh, scientists have never seen it. We only assume it exists because without it, the behavior of stars, planets, and galaxies simply would not make sense. Cosmologists currently believe the behavior of galaxies explained largely by dark matter. But we don't fully know what dark matter is made of. 
One study from December of 2021 theorizes that it comes from black holes. Whether it's made, uh, whatever it's made of, dark matter appears to be spread across the cosmos in a net-like pattern with galaxy clusters forming at the nodes where fibers intersect. Right? Maybe we're all just ants in a big old cosmic anthill for some celestial deity or some big weird spiderweb situation. Uh, now for antimatter, which is not the same as dark matter. Antimatter thought to have been created along with matter after the Big Bang. But because we live in a universe made of matter, obvious that there is not the that much antimatter around, otherwise there would be nothing left. Unlike dark matter, physicists can actually manufacture antimatter in a laboratory. Uh, humans have created antimatter particles using ultra-high-speed collisions at huge particle accelerators, such as the Large uh, Hadron Collider, uh, which is located outside Geneva, operated by CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research. Several experiments at CERN have created anti-hydrogen, the antimatter twin of the element hydrogen, the most complex antimatter element produced to date, anti-helium, counterpart to helium, of course. Uh, dark matter is important because its existence or potential lack thereof proves or disproves some of our most basic ideas about how the laws of physics work. But why is antimatter important? Well, that goes back to the Big Bang. Antimatter is at the heart of a mystery about why the universe exists. In the first moments after the Big Bang, only energy existed. As the universe cooled and expanded, particles of both matter and antimatter were produced. Scientists have measured the properties of particles and antiparticles with extremely high precision and found they both behave identically. So if antimatter and matter were created in equal amounts and they behave identically, all the matter and antimatter created by the beginning of time or at the beginning of time should have annihilated on contact, leaving nothing behind. Why did matter come to dominate? One theory suggests that more matter than antimatter was created in the beginning of the universe so that even after mutual annihilation, there was enough matter left to form stars, galaxies, and eventually everything on Earth. And now let's talk briefly about Earth's formation before looking into creationism and intelligent design and how I think a creationist worldview and or an intelligent design worldview can cohabitate beautifully with the Big Bang Theory. Uh, the Earth condensed out of interstellar gas and dust some 4.6 billion years ago. We know from fossil records that the origin of life happened soon after, perhaps around 4 billion years ago, in the ponds and oceans of the primitive Earth. The first living things were not anything so complex as a one-cell organism, already a highly sophisticated form of life. The first stirrings were much more humble. In those early days, lightning and ultraviolet light from the sun were breaking apart the simple hydrogen-rich molecules of the primitive atmosphere, the fragments spontaneously recombining into more and more complex molecules. The products of this early chemistry were dissolved in the oceans, forming a kind of organic soup of gradually increasing complexity until one day, quite by accident, a molecule arose that was able to make crude copies of itself using as building blocks other molecules in the soup. This was the ancestor of DNA. As time went on, these molecules got better at reproducing. Molecules with specialized functions eventually joined together, making a kind of molecular collective, the first cell. By three billion years ago, a number of one-celled plants joined together, the first multicellular organisms. Sex seems to have been invented around 2 billion years ago. Hail Lucifina! Actually, sex was not very hot in the beginning. Just, you know, creepy little mud and water organisms. Little fucking creepy uh, crawlers pushing their virtually mindless and not sexy bodies into one another. Before sex, new varieties of organisms could arise only from the accumulation of random mutations, the selection of changes letter by letter in the genetic instructions. But by 1 billion years ago, plants working cooperatively, now we're making a stunning change in the environment of the earth. Green plants generating molecular oxygen. Since the oceans were by now filled with simple green plants, oxygen beginning to, uh, was becoming a major component of the earth's atmosphere. The transition to an oxidizing atmosphere posed a supreme crisis in the history of life. And a great many organisms unable to cope with oxygen perished. A few primitive forms such as the botulism and tetanus bacilli managed to survive even today, only in oxygen-free environments. For most of this time, the predominant plant was what we now today uh, call algae, blue-green slime, covering and filling the oceans. But around 600 million years ago, the monopolizing grip of algae was broken, and an enormous proliferation of new life forms would emerge, an event called the Cambrian Explosion. Among the organisms preserved in fossils from this time are relatives of crustaceans and starfish, sponges, mollusks, worms, and chordates. It took roughly 3 billion years for these life forms with specialized organs to a form, much longer than it took for basic life itself to appear. That could mean that there are planets today that have abundant microbes 
but are yet to see, you know, wolves and fruit and lady vaginas and stuff. Soon after the Cambrian explosion, the oceans teemed with many different forms of life. In rapid succession, the first fish and the first vertebrates appeared. Plants previously restricted to the oceans began the colonization of the land. The first insect evolved, and its descendants became the pioneers in the colonization of the land by animals. Winged insects arose together with the amphibians, creatures something like a, like a lungfish, able to survive both on land and in the water. The first trees and first reptiles appeared. Dinosaurs evolved. Mammals emerged. Then the first birds. The first flowers. Dinosaurs became extinct. The earliest cetaceans, ancestors of the dolphin and the whale, arose. And in the same period, primates. Ancestors of monkeys, apes, and humans showed up. Less than 10 million years ago, the first creatures who closely resembled human beings evolved, accompanied by a spectacular increase in brain size for some of us. Then, only a few million years ago, the first true humans emerged. All of this would have uh, never happened without evolution, working through mutation and selection. Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace are jointly created with coming up with the theory of evolution by natural selection, having co-published on it uh, in uh, 1858. Darwin is the name we know, obviously, uh, you know, much more today. Darwin has generally uh, overshadowed Wallace after the publication of On the Origin of Species the following year, 1859. In Darwin and Wallace's time, most believed that organisms were too com- most believed that organisms were too complex to have natural origins, and must have been designed by a transcendent God. Natural selection, however, states that even the most complex organisms occur by totally natural processes. How? In natural selection, genetic mutations that are beneficial to an individual's survival are passed on through reproduction. This results in a new generation of organisms more likely to survive uh, to reproduce. For example, evolving long necks has enabled giraffes to feed on leaves others can't reach, giving them a competitive advantage. Thanks to a better food source, those with longer necks were able to survive to reproduce and pass on the characteristic to succeeding generations. Those with shorter necks and access to less food, you know, less likely to survive, to pass on their genes. An organism can't evolve something, uh, you know, can't evolve something to meet a pre-existing need. So in the case of giraffes, giraffes wouldn't have evolved to have long necks to eat the food. Instead, the giraffes who already had long necks would be more successful than those who didn't. Generation after generation, natural selection acts as a kind of sieve or remover of undesirable traits. Organisms therefore gradually become better suited for the environment. If the environment changes, natural selection then pushes organisms to evolve in a different direction to adapt to new circumstances. But there are many people who don't believe this shit, right? It's all just a bunch of, you know, heretical kind of demonic gobbledygook. They believe that the universe was created in a matter of days by an all-powerful and all-knowing being. These are creationists. And after laying out their beliefs, I will share how I think a creationist and an evolutionist, if you just look at it in an interpretive way, can be the same person. Uh, Creationism, also known as creation science, is the belief that the universe and living organisms originate from specific acts of divine creation, as described in the Christian Bible or other religious texts, rather than by natural processes such as evolution. Some also feel that creation science is synonymous with intelligent design. I tend to think that intelligent design uh, is broader than creationism. At a broader level, uh, a creationist is someone who believes in a God who is an absolute creator of heaven and earth out of nothing, right? Who, you know, created it out of nothing, uh, you know, by an act of free will. Such a deity generally thought to be transcendent, meaning beyond human experience and constantly involved, imminent in the creation, ready to intervene as necessary and without whose constant concern, the creation would cease or disappear. Christians, Jews, Muslims, all creationists in this sense. Uh, So we can see the creationism as a belief system. You know, it's a wide category encompassing all kinds of religious beliefs, even beliefs outside of established religion, if you think that a deity was or is in charge of everything around us today. It may surprise you that though Christianity is approximately two millennia old, true creationism, as we think of it today, a relatively new phenomenon. Though the Bible has a major place uh, in the life of any Christian, it hasn't always been the case that the Bible has been taken so literally, right, as uh, by many Christians today. Not at all, actually. Catholics, especially dating back to the days of St. Augustine around 400 CE, and even going back to earlier thinkers like the 3rd century CE, Alexandrian Christian scholar and theologian, Origen, headed back to Alexandria again now, have always recognized that at times the Bible needs to be taken metaphorically or allegorically. When Augustine, uh, or, you know, St. Augustine or St. Augustine became a Christian, we knew, uh, you know, he knew, excuse me, full well the problems of Genesis. 
the part of the Bible that describes how the universe was created and was eager to help his fellow believers from getting ensnared in traps of literalism. It was not until the Protestant Reformation around 1500 CE that the Bible started to take on its unique central position as the great reformers, especially Luther and Calvin, stressed the need to go by scripture alone and not by what they took to be unnecessarily complicated traditions of the Catholic Church. But even those guys had doubts about, you know, true literalism as we think of it today. Uh, Literalism as it pertains to the Bible is defined as the idea that the words found in the Bible are basically historical records, not metaphors or figures of speech, but things that actually happened 100% as written. And the roots of today's literalists don't go very far back. It begins with the birth of the modern, uh, you know, of modern Christian fundamentalism in the late 19th century. Some scholars date the birth of Christian fundamentalism back to 1878, born out of the Niagara Bible Conference. The Niagara Bible Conference, a.k.a. the Believer's Meeting for Bible Study, was an event held yearly from 1876 to 1897, with the exception of 1884. In the year 1878, some attendees authored what became known as the Niagara Creed, a 14-point statement of faith, which became the basis for many of today's fundamentalist beliefs. Uh, Here's number nine. We believe that all the scriptures from first to last center about our Lord Jesus Christ in his person and work, in his first and second coming, and hence that no chapter, even of the Old Testament, is properly read or understood until it leads to him. And moreover, that all the scriptures from first to last, including every chapter, even of the Old Testament, were designed for our practical instruction. But still, this new interpretation of scripture wouldn't really have taken up, you know, big space or wouldn't take up big space in American uh, mainstream culture for several more decades. That was when a man most of us have likely never heard of really brought fundamentalism to life in America. The anti-evolution campaign of the 1920s might have never happened without the leadership of a little-known Baptist minister from Minneapolis, William B. Riley. In a state far north of the Bible Belt and short on Baptists at that time, uh, Kentucky-born Riley built a 3,000-member downtown congregation based and emerged, uh, or excuse me, and... uh, based in, you know, fundamentalism and and emerged as the dominant figure in American fundamentalism. Riley's distinctive brand of fundamentalism combined social activism, puritanical moralism, and a literalist, pre-millennialist theology. Seeing liquor as the source of most urban problems, he became an outspoken advocate of prohibition. Following the adoption of the 18th Amendment in 1919, Riley then turned his attention to another threat to Christian life as he sought. The new infidelity known as modernism. Riley invented the label fundamentalist and became the prime mover in the movement that took the name. The year uh, That year, Riley brought together 6,000 conservative Christians for the first conference of an organization he founded, the World Christian Fundamentals Association, WCFA. Riley warned his delegates that mainline Protestant denominations were coming increasingly under the sway of modernism. Riley urged them to stand by their traditional faith in the face of the modernist threat, saying, God forbid that we should fail him in the hour when the battle is heavy, right? We're going to war, motherfuckers. The devil's near. Gosh dang, get ready. Uh, For his own part, Riley led the effort to purge the Northern Baptist denominations uh, of who he considered to be liberals, not in the political sense, but in the religious sense. Liberals and by association, modernists, now defined as those who tended to believe in church reform and compromise with the secular world. Riley made the teaching of evolution in the public schools public enemy number one. Evolution, he declared, was the propaganda of infidelity palmed off in the name of science, right? Burn the scientist. By 1922, the WFCA was actively promoting an anti-evolution agenda around the country. In Kentucky, Baptists pushed an anti-evolution law that lost by only a single vote in the House of Representatives. Meanwhile, William Riley roamed the country campaigning against evolution in public speeches, offering to debate evolutionists wherever he could find them. By the beginning of 1923, Riley would report in a letter to former U.S. Congressman, former U.S. Secretary of State, and uh, one-time presidential candidate, William Jennings Bryan, the whole country is seething on the evolution question. Bryan, now at the end of his long life, had become a staunch anti-evolutionist and fierce promoter of Protestant literalism. Riley debated a science writer named Maynard Shipley becoming uh, before large crowds up and down the West Coast. Brian shared his efforts, observing in a letter, he seemed to have the audience overwhelmingly with him in Los Angeles, Oakland, and Portland. This is very encouraging. It shows that the ape man hypothesis is not very strong outside the colleges and modernist, aka liberal, pulpits. 
The WFCA in editorials, probably written by Riley, denounced evolution as inconsistent with the Bible, bad science, a threat to peace and morality. By 1923, Riley, in an article, linked uh, evolution to anarchist socialistic propaganda and labeled those who would teach it, often fellow Christians, as atheists. By the 1930s, Riley's attacks became even more over the top when he warned of an international Jewish Bolshevik Darwinist conspiracy. And he congratulated Adolf Hitler on his attempts to confront such a conspiracy in Germany. Uh, Dude just asked for seconds at a dinner where only cringe is being served. Uh, In the mid-1930s, when the fate of Tennessee's anti-evolution bill hung in doubt, William Riley and his major allies, Billy Sunday, Frank Norris, and William Jennings Bryan, roused the faithful to write letters and send telegrams to undecided legislators. Their main opponent, their main opponent would be famed lawyer Clarence Darrow, uh, the lawyer we first met here in the Suck First in the Leopold and Loeb perfect murder suck, who defended modernism and argued that evolution and religion could stand together in his 1925 testimony to state legislature. Roaming the courtroom in his white shirt and suspenders, he painted a picture of a blissful Tennessee, happily doing what it knew to be best, until Riley and his fundamentalist followers made the state a target of anti-evolution agenda. He said, here is the state of Tennessee going along in its own business, teaching evolution for years. State boards handing out books on evolution, professors in colleges, teachers in schools, lawyers at the bar, physicians, ministers. A great percentage of the intelligent citizens of the state of Tennessee are evolutionists. They have not even thought it was necessary to leave their church. They believed that they could appreciate and understand their own simple doctrine or doctrine of the Nazarene to love thy neighbor, be kindly to them, not to place a fine on and not to try to send to jail some man who did not believe that they, what they believed and got along all right with it too until something happened. They believed that all that was here was not made on the first six days of creation, but that it had come by a slow process, extending over the ages that one thing grew out of another. There are people who believe that organic life and the plants and the animals and man and the mind of man and the religion of man are the subjects of evolution. They believe that God is still working to make something better and higher still out of human beings and that evolution had been working forever and will work forever. They believe it. And along comes somebody who says, we all have got to believe as I believe it. It is a crime to know more than I know. Fucking love that. Yes. Hail Nimrod. Yeah, religion and science can actually coexist very peacefully. You can be extremely faithful, great Christian, also be an evolution-loving scientist. You just have to not be so stubborn in insisting that your interpretation of ancient scripture has to be 100% literal. Riley did not think evolution and religion could coexist. By the end of the 1920s, not many agreed with him, though. Literalism was fading. 1927, despite a furious effort by Riley and his followers, the legislature of his home state of Minnesota rejected a bill to ban the teaching of evolution by an eight-to-one margin. 1928, uh, Riley became a fringe figure within his own denomination. By the uh, early 1930s, he preached a virulent form of anti-Semitism, became a fascist sympathizer, lost more followers and friends. But the ideas he proclaimed found homes later in other theologians who would push what he taught to a much wider audience. And literalism would surge again, especially in post-World War II America. And it continues to surge. 1968, the Supreme Court would strike down a ruling in Arkansas that led to a 10th grade biology teacher with a master's in zoology to being fired and being charged with a misdemeanor for teaching, quote, the theory or doctrine that mankind ascended or descended from a lower order of animals or to adopt or use in any such institution a textbook that teaches that theory. In 1987, a Supreme Court struck down a Louisiana law that required biology teachers who taught the theory of evolution to also discuss evidence supporting a theory called creation science. In October of 1999, the New York Times reported on a Kansas school board who voted to delete from its standard educational curriculum, a description of the Big Bang Theory of cosmic origin, the central organizing principle, right, of modern astronomy and cosmology in favor of intelligent design. Philip Johnson, who taught law for over 30 years at the University of California, Berkeley, known as the father of intelligent design, the idea in its current form appeared in the 80s, and Johnson adopted and developed it after Darwinian evolution came up short in his view of explaining how all organisms, including humans, came into being. And I actually like a a lot of his thoughts. He explains intelligent design like this, saying, I would like to put a basic explanation of the intelligent design concept as I understand it this way. There are two hypotheses to consider scientifically. One is you need a creative intelligence to do all the creating that has been done in the history of life. The other is you don't. 
because we can show that unintelligent, purposeless, natural processes are capable of doing and actually did do the whole job. Now, that is what is taught as fact in our textbooks. And to me, it's a hypothesis, uh, which needs to be tested by evidence and experiment. If it can't be confirmed by experiment, then you're left with the same two possibilities, and neither one should be said to be something like a scientific fact. What he was arguing against, he termed materialism, not in the sense of greed or people wanting material objects, but describing a philosophical belief that everything is at the bottom, material composition. You start with the fundamental particles that compose matter and energy, work up to atoms, particles, cells, plants, animals. It's all just stuff. Operating like stuff operates with no spiritual component. And he would say a philosophy of naturalism or materialism is what generates the Darwinian theory. It's what generates the certainty that only unintelligent natural forces were involved in evolution, which is to say, in the creative process, that brought our kind into existence as well as all the animals and all the plants. That is all a non-negotiable claim on their part. And why is it a non-negotiable claim? Because if the naturalistic starting point isn't valid, if it isn't completely correct, then something else must have happened. What is that something else? It's something that they don't like that might get a foothold in science itself. The negative side of naturalism is that the naturalistic viewpoint leaves the way open for a kind of freedom from divine authority, a kind of moral anarchy. Believing in Darwinian evolution doesn't prove that there's no God. What it proves is that there's no need for God's participation to get all the creating done. Now, is that true? I was fascinated with the question of what's fundamentally true. If this Darwinian story is true, then nature does have all the creative powers it needs to produce plants and animals and people. But if the story isn't true, if it doesn't fit the evidence, then maybe the creator is something more than an imaginary projection of people's minds. Maybe a creator is a necessary part of reality. Okay, but I just think like, what if an intelligent designer designed evolution itself? What if it ignited the Big Bang explosion? A version of that view could be very compatible with many who do believe in intelligent design. But then there are the new, extremely literal literalists, uh, young earth creationists. Their beliefs have gained a lot of traction in recent decades. Young earth creationists have adopted a method of biblical interpretation, which requires that the earth be no more than 10,000 years old, and that the six days of creation described in Genesis each lasted, you know, literally just 24 hours. Young earth creationists are among the more organized creationist movements. Two of the largest groups, Answers in Genesis and the Institute for Creation Research, produce magazines, websites, books, and videos for general audiences, as well as published journals which report on so-called creation science. In May of 2007, Answers in Genesis opened a multi-million dollar creation museum in Kentucky, aimed at attracting a wide public audience. The Institute for Creation Research was founded by Henry Morris in 1970 and operates another museum, the Museum of Creation and Earth History in Santee, California, which is a suburb of San Diego. YEC writings tend to focus on attempting to explain why much of modern science cannot be correct. For example, young Earth creationists spend considerable effort trying to explain why the Earth just simply can't be 4.5 billion years old. They also make arguments for the feasibility of Noah's Ark and for the occurrence of a single worldwide flood within the last 5,000 years. And that is something that does not match up with our current scientific understanding of geology, archaeology, and more, you know, at all. Despite that, as of a 2019 survey, survey, 40% of U.S. adults ascribe to this strictly creationist view of human origin, believing that God created them in their present form within roughly the past 10,000 years. However, more Americans still continue to think, you know, that humans have evolved over millions of years, either with God's guidance. 33%, or increasingly without God's involvement, 22%. Okay, we're on the home stretch now. Time to share what I think about, you know, kind of joining a lot of these thoughts. You know, I just want to address, uh, you know, how I said earlier that a belief in the Big Bang and evolution, everything we went over could match up with a belief in creationism and intelligent design. Well, how could that be? It can't all match up if we strictly interpret the Bible in extremely literal terms. But I think that's fine because no one actually does that. People say that they are true literalists, but literally no one is 100% literal when it comes to the entire Bible or when it comes to any other ancient religious text. Uh, Reverend William B. Riley, right? One of the fathers of modern American literalism, right? Not actually a literalist. If you think about, you know, what that truly means and stay with me, Baptists and other fundamental Christians, I'm gonna support an argument that your Christian God could 100% be real. It just won't seem like it for a few minutes. But people who claim to literally follow the entire Bible or any other core text of another religion are literally always kidding themselves to some degree. Uh, The book of Leviticus alone, all kinds of rules. No one follows all of them in a literal sense today. 
right? Don't eat animals with split hooves. Don't eat animals that don't have fins and scales. Don't mate two different kinds of animals. Don't trim off your hair at your temples. Don't trim your beard. Don't wear clothing made from two different types of fabric. Don't fail to include salt in offerings to God. If you have sex with your wife when she's on her period, you're both banished from the community. Anyone who curses their father or mother shall be put to death. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, even with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and adulteress must be put to death and on and on and on. And that's just one of many biblical books, right? There are all kinds of rules regarding how people should be killed for this offense to God, that offense, on and on throughout the Bible. So how many mainstream congregations in the U.S. encourage members to literally follow all these rules, to stone people to death, left and right, for all sorts of shit that's not actually illegal? How many members are not eating about 80% of what most people eat today? You know, how many people are not wearing mixed fabrics, et cetera, et cetera? Literally zero. No one's even trying to do all that. So clearly there's always room for some interpretation, including how you interpret literalism, right? And so since everyone is doing some interpreting, Jews, Muslims, Christians, everyone else, why can't we, especially when you come to think about how space-time can warp and bend, why can't we believe that one day for God could mean something entirely different than it does to us dumb meat sacks here on earth? Interpreting things this way, the biblical story of creation in the book of Genesis pairs up very well with a lot of what we just went over, right? Day one was light, bang, the big bang. And then over the following five biblical days, the atmosphere came before dry ground. Plants came before animals. Sea creatures came before land animals. Land animals came before humans. All that blends pretty well with the big bang theory and evolution. If you just zoom out, if you just accept what we've learned about space time and black holes, time could be changed a millisecond in a different portion of the universe in some, you know, center of a black hole could be a lifetime here, right? That point of singularity, maybe the center of these black holes, that singularity that stands outside of space and time, maybe that's a portal to where some intelligent designer lives. Maybe it's part of an intelligent designer or at least connected to something, some creative power truly beyond our comprehension. And maybe that power, that force is God. And maybe billions of years ago, you know, for us is less than 10,000 years to God. Maybe time means nothing to some God force. And since ancient humans were unable to understand that concept, simple parables were given to them so that they could understand. Parables that would help keep them alive, keep them from eating foods that could spoil easily, keep uh, them mating so that the species could continue to advance. I don't know. I mean, I'm just philosophizing. Uh, For a while in my life, I was on the edge of identifying as an atheist. uh, And it was actually talking about the Big Bang Theory in a Catholic college course on theology. Uh, that left me thinking I would at least be agnostic for the rest of my days. I would be someone who believed that there is something beyond our comprehension that in some way set everything in the universe in motion, right? My professor, I can picture his bearded face. Uh, I remember he always wear like black turtlenecks, uh, kind of a bigger guy. I remember our conversation very well, just can't remember his name. He told me about what he called the domino effect theory. And it was like, it had a profound effect on me. It comes from the teachings of the 13th century Dominican priest, Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas Aquinas, major theologian of the Catholic Church. And Aquinas argued that everything in the natural world has a cause. For example, in a domino chain, each domino that falls causes another domino to fall. The cause of one domino falling is the previous domino falling. And he believed that sequential causes in the past, like a set of dominoes, could have been occurring for all eternity, kind of almost, right? For almost all eternity. He denied that an infinite series of motions is possible, believing that at some point, right, someone, some force had to push that first domino that would lead to all the other dominoes moving, dominoes that are still falling today and will still fall tomorrow. And he believed that that first force is what we call God. Using that to explain the Big Bang Theory and all the evolution that follows, one's faith would not have to be shaken at all, right, by any of it, by any of it. Uh, There was a massive universe building explosion, fine. All the elements that led to the creation of planets, galaxies, black holes, everything else was created by this explosion? Sure. Our planet started up as a primordial ball of mud and water where little single-celled organisms formed and their formation through natural selection and evolution slowly led to the formation of all the creatures in the world today? Cool. So how did the elements that led to the Big Bang explosion get there? What was the domino before the explosion? That is what the theory does not reasonably account for. And that is where science fails us. What? or whom pushed the first domino forward. The ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle, right, student of Plato, taught his students, students like Alexander the Great, a law of physics that is still taught today. Something cannot come from nothing. 
Aristotle taught it by stating nothing can come from nothing, but you get it. Something cannot come from nothing is the law of physics now known as the law of conservation of mass energy. The law states that matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transformed. The first law of thermodynamics, another way of expressing this law. It's a fundamental law of physics. So if something cannot ever come from nothing, then there must have been something before the Big Bang. And thus there was something before the very existence of the universe. The Big Bang theory does not account for what that might be. Some scientists in recent years have wildly speculated that before the Big Bang, before the existence of even atoms, the physical world might have been made up of some kind of soup of short-lived elementary particles, including quarks, the building blocks of protons and neutrons. Fine, maybe it was. But where the fuck did that shit come from? You can literally play that game forever, right? What came before that? Okay, fine. What came before that? I don't believe science will ever satisfactorily explain the true origin, the origin point of the universe. And that is why I believe in the existence of some type of God force, a God that might be the God of one of our religions or multiple religions, right? Could be Jesus, could be a a God of several religions that each religion has seen a piece of, a God that might be a very intelligent designer, still around in some way, still shaping things and pushing things along and watching in some way. I mean, not sure I believe that God, whatever God is, has ever chosen to speak to us in lowly humans, but maybe. I can't fucking know, right? For sure. Uh, Neither can anybody else. I sure shit wasn't there when various prophets have claimed to have communicated with God. So I would just be an asshole if I definitively tried to dismiss religious teachings as not being valid. I guess I belong to the church of God is real. I just don't know what the fuck God is or what God wants from us or what God has in store for us, if anything. Hail Nimrod. I hope you enjoyed this exploration of space and black holes and time and the nature of the universe and our own existence today. I had so much fun digging into it myself. As crazy as thinking about it drives me sometimes. I uh, I like how there's so much about the universe we still don't know, right? We don't know exactly what dark matter is. We don't know exactly with 100% certainty with how black holes operate or if wormholes exist or what led to the Big Bang. We don't even know with 100% certainty that the Big Bang did happen. Sounds like we're pretty certain that if it didn't happen exactly the way we think about it, something close to it happened. But, you know, it's all still theoretical to some degree. Just like when ancient humans stared up at the cosmos, they didn't know exactly what was going up, going on up there. And, you know, still today, neither do we. And I think that mystery is awesome, right? When we stare up at some distant star, some star surrounded by planets, planets that might have rings or moons and a solar system that may have comets and asteroids and a black fucking hole lurking out past the edge of the solar system. There could be someone on one of the planets orbiting that same star, staring up at their night sky. And in that sky, they can see our star and wonder what it all means. Wonder what created it all. They could have entirely different religions and notions about existence and creation. I hope we all get to know someday truly what it means. But until then, what a fun mystery to explore and think about. I hope that when we find out, I hope there is something in the world after uh, this for all of us. And, uh... Now, fellow stardust meat sacks, fellow sentient beings composed of atoms created by stars that were created by the Big Bang. How fucking cool is that? That we are all in a very real way built of stardust. Let's head to today's top five takeaways. After a few words from 20th century American astronomer and astrophysicist Carl Sagan's PBS TV series and accompanying book Cosmos. I think this is so beautiful. As long as there have been humans, we have searched for our place in the cosmos. In the childhood of our species, when our ancestors gazed a little idly at the stars, among the Ionian scientists of ancient Greece and in our own age, we have been transfixed by this question. Where are we? Who are we? We find that we live on an insignificant planet of a humdrum star lost between two spiral arms in the outskirts of a galaxy, which is a member of a sparse cluster of galaxies tucked away in some forgotten corner of a universe in which there are far more galaxies than people. Since Aristarchus, every step in our quest has moved us farther from center stage in the cosmic drama, there has not been much time to assimilate these new findings. There are those who secretly deplore these great discoveries, who consider every step a demotion, who in their heart of hearts still pine for a universe whose center, focus, and fulcrum is the earth. But if we are to deal with the cosmos, we must first understand it, even if our hopes for some unearned preferential status are, in the process, contravened. Understanding where we live is an essential precondition for improving the neighborhood. Knowing what other neighborhoods are like also helps. If we long for our planet to be important, there is something we can do about it. We make our world significant by the courage of our questions and the depth of our answers. 
We began as wanderers, and we are wanderers still. We have lingered long enough on the shores of the cosmic ocean. We are ready at last to set, sta- to set sail for the stars. I almost got through that messing part up. I love that we have lingered long enough on the shores of the cosmic ocean. We are ready at last to set sail for the stars. Man, what a beautiful quote. All right, stardust wanderer, fellow truth seeker. Now it's time for today's takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, it all began with the Big Bang. Probably. Though the Big Bang is a theory, it's the leading one. We have for the formation of our universe, the rapid expansion of matter from a state of extremely high density and temperature, spawning dust that coalesced into stars, planets, galaxies, and black holes. Number two, for many years in Europe, while non-Western mathematicians and theorists were charting the stars and understanding the universe, the debate still raged about whether the sun or the earth were at the center of our universe. Now we know neither to be true. We're on the distant outskirts of the universe. But we do now know that we for sure orbit the sun. And that both the sun and our own planet are round as fuck. Number three, when Einstein put forward his general theory of relativity that gravity itself is the bending of space and time by mass and energy, it was a seminal moment in the history of science. Today, over a hundred years after general real, re, oh my God, today, over a hundred years after general relativity was first presented, new technologies allowing us to explore the most remarkable predictions of the theory. An expanding universe, black holes, ripples in space time. And perhaps the most bizarre, the idea that not just space, but time itself can be distorted and is distorted by heavy objects. Number four, not everybody believes the Big Bang or evolution or really any of the scientific tenets that have proven over and over, again, to be true to various degrees. Creationists believe that the world was created, uh, if they're Christian, according to the Bible, by God, most likely in seven literal days, as per Genesis. Though it would seem like this idea is as old as Christianity itself and actually began in the 19th century when Christian leaders were divided over whether or not to modernize the church and chose to attack evolution. But what if seven days for God is billions of years for the rest of us? Expand your mind just a bit and both science and religion can both reside inside of it. Number five, new info. What does the future look like for our sun? Could it become a black hole? One billion years from now, the sun will be 10% brighter than it is currently. This will trigger a moist greenhouse effect here on earth, similar to the hellish Venus environments that we see today. Under these conditions, life as we know it will be unable to survive anywhere on the surface of Earth. And in the very distant future, the sun will run out of hydrogen fuel. This will begin in approximately 6.4 billion years, at which point the sun will exit the main sequence stage of its life. With its hydrogen exhausted in its core, its inner helium ash that is built up there will become unstable and collapse under its own weight. The helium outside its core will then start to fuse in a shell around the dead core. And then our star will enter the red giant phase and swell up much faster. It's been calculated that the expanding sun will grow large enough to encompass the orbits of Mercury, Venus, and maybe even Earth. But it won't become a black hole. It's just not big enough. Sorry, Meat Sacks. We have a shitty little wimp of a sun in the center of our solar system. I hate to say it, but it's, it's fucking weak. We have a pathetic little bitch boy sun. It's gross. Makes me uh, want to stare at it, right? How can you still blind me when you're so fucking weak? Chris Cornell was never singing about you. He was singing about a better sun somewhere else. About a billion years after the sun tries to swallow Earth, the red giant will undergo a process called helium flash, where huge amounts of helium are fused into carbon in a matter of minutes. Once that happens, the star shrinks but gains luminosity. Over the course of the next 20 million years, the sun will become unstable and will begin to lose mass through a series of thermal pulses, powerful bursts of radiation that will fling the sun's material out into space. After about 500,000 years of these stellar tantrums, the sun will have tossed away half its mass. That discarded material will briefly form a beautiful planetary nebula. The remnant will eventually cool and become a white dwarf, which is mostly made up of just carbon and oxygen. The smoldering ember will glow for trillions of years before finally fading to black. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Black holes and the nature of the universe have been sucked. A little nod to He-Man there. If you were like, what was that from? Uh, thank you to producer Sophie Evans for the initial research today. Killing it on this complex science suck. Uh, thanks to Tyler C. Recording and editing this episode today, The Suck Ranger. So you can watch on YouTube in addition to listening. And if you do watch it on YouTube, please also watch my new special, Trying to Get Better Out Now. Leave some fucking black hole comments. Why not? Uh, next week, jumping right back to the world of 
true crime with a wild one. Uh, the crazy story of the murderous Briley brothers. Three brothers and an accomplice murdered at least 11 people as a group in Richmond, Virginia in 1979. Just had a, a blast there doing some shows, by the way. Uh, unlike many killers, they didn't seem to have a strong MO or preferred victim type. The Brileys were opportunistic killers. They often went out at night looking for victims. They committed brutal murders, rapes, robbed the victims of valuables. They targeted men and women, young and old. The group ended their months-long crime spree by murdering an entire fucking family. After they were arrested, the Brileys' accomplice turned on them and revealed everything to investigators to save himself from the death penalty. He connected the Brileys and himself to several unsolved homicides. Linwood Briley, the oldest brother, was the leader of the group, followed by the second oldest, James. They influenced their younger brother, Anthony, and neighbor, Duncan Meekins, to participate in these horrific crimes. Uh, Linwood was described by many people as highly intelligent, possibly, if not probably, a genius. And he was smart enough to later uh, help others break out of death row. This is a story that reads like a thriller or maybe a horror flick or both. Next week on Time Suck. Right now, time for today's Time Sucker updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker updates. First up, some library talk. Huge fucking nerd. Book person. Gross. And librarian sack Taylor Watson. Share some information about why he thinks libraries matter. Writing, salutations, suck master, and greetings. I'm reaching to you today as a mere meat sack of a librarian, wanting to thank you for all of the praise and support you gave in the Library of Alexandria episode of Time Suck. While most people think of libraries as book storage facilities, some branches will lend out video games and VR headsets. Others give out diapers, period products, free legal system advice, such as attorneys, public defenders, social workers, and much more. Libraries are truly vital to all members of any society. Anyways, thank you again for all that you do. Can't wait to see you in St. Louis. Last set you did here was fantastic. My wife and I are big fans of your comedic humor. We still have a DVD of Crazy with the Capital F signed by you when we saw you live for the first time. And yes, we still play it quite often. Man, that's a long time going. A long time back. Uh, Till next time, Suck Master Supreme. Cheers. Regards, Taylor Watson. Well, Taylor, thanks for sharing uh, more about modern libraries in the U.S. They really are such special places. Uh, Vibe-wise, I find them to be opposite of the idiots of the internet. Like for anyone listening, if you think the world is just mostly aggressively ignorant dipshits posting horrible conspiratorial and propagandized bullshit in places like 4chan or Reddit, and that's really bumming you out, take a little trip to your local library. Be reminded that the world still has many rational, thoughtful, intelligent, educated, cool as fuck people who still apply critical thinking and reason to the world around them and the way they live their lives. Uh, Hail Nimrod, thanks for being a fan for so long, and uh, thanks for, for what you do, Taylor. And next up, Grateful Sack Rory Fitzpatrick. Loves the cult of the curious, three out of five stars, private Facebook group. Turns out that a lot of you meat sacks playing around in there are not pieces of shit. Uh, Rory writes, I just wanted to drop a big fat Hail Nimrod and thank the cult for all the love we've been given on Facebook. My family has been busting our asses to move home, and a couple weeks ago, that dream happened. I posted our picture to the cult just to share our excitement. And the outpouring of support and love has blown our minds. Dan, you've really created something amazing and there's no way to appropriately thank you for what you've done. I didn't, yeah, create the Facebook group. I'm, I'm happy that it evolved around this. But just, yeah, the people in there, they're, they're doing it themselves. Uh, I'd also like to include a shout out to the love of my life. Angie, you're the best. I'm proud of you and you make our family stronger every day. And thank you for not catching the whole serial killer makes gloves from women's hands. Oh, Billy Shakes. Uh, that bullshit. Because I haven't laughed that hard in a long time. Yes, Dan, you magnificent bastard. You got her good. I refuse to say how sorry I am for the long message. Just wanted to thank as many meat sacks as possible in one shot. Keep fucking sucking. Much love from the whole family, Rory. Uh, Rory, I'm so glad that you got so much love. It is good and refreshing to see people online, you know, reacting with support and love instead of jealousy and hate, isn't it? So many great people in the community. Uh, I am so sorry that your wife, Angie, is, is so dumb. That's got to be hard on you. Right, I imagine you would have achieved your your dream of you know getting home so much sooner if you didn't have to lug around that dead weight. I'm guessing she must be super hot to make up for what she's not bringing to the table mentally. So, <laughs> so that's no, don't JK. Uh, no, I'm glad that you and Angie, uh, who sounds great, are living where you're supposed to be living. Hail Nimrod, yeah, and congrats on getting home. I love uh, how happy you sound. And finally, Kelly Burns, a but really Becky from Discord has so much more to share about libraries. Uh, I have met Kelly a few times now, and she is a delightful human being. An incredible meat sack. 
Uh, thank you, Kelly, for continuing to make the, the Time Suck Discord such a great place. You continue to be the best. And now that I'm done sucking your dick, your lady dick, here's your wonderful and informative message. Kelly Becky writes, Hi, Dan, fearless cult leader, knowledge spreader. It is I, Becky, resident Discord librarian. I want to start by saying I had a physical reaction when I heard there would be a library adjacent suck. I spend about 23 hours of the day looking for reasons to talk about libraries. And as much as I appreciate you for reminding the cult how important libraries are, you barely scratch the surface on the reasons why. Yes, libraries still have physical books and many people still love a physical book, but libraries have adapted so much to the needs of every single human. So I wanted to share a few things many libraries offer that some people may not be aware of. Along with physical books, libraries hold the license to electronic and audio books, as well as music and movies to stream for free. And while books remain a great source of information, libraries also offer access to many databases and periodicals as well. So you can ignore all those damn paywalls for a lot of news sources. I actually did not know that. Uh, or forgot. No, I don't think I, did. I, don't think I knew that. The only thing I forgot. I, uh, I do wonder if they have access to certain databases typically reserved for only students and faculties of certain universities. Because I have hit dead ends trying to access those on my own. Uh, Kelly Becky continues... And she says, uh, library staff also help people find jobs with digital literacy and, res and resume building classes and job search resources. My local library has vast immigrant services. And last year, they held a naturalization ceremony for 95 new citizens from 31 countries. Many libraries have started integrating maker spaces. These creative studios consist of 3D printers, laser cutters, sewing machines, digital creator software, recording studios, audio and photography equipment, green screens, and or musical instruments. One of our local branches even has a kitchen and a couple of them loan out telescopes, all for free. Holy shit, Becky from Discord. Libraries have been upgrading. Uh, she continues saying, libraries also offer free events for people of all ages. And while most of our memories come from going to the library as a kid, the programs for adults are just as cool. They have classes teaching people how to be creators, how to research their family history, promoting health and wellness with yoga or walking groups, even trivia and game nights, all for free. My library even hosts a Stephen King book club. These services are just a fraction of what many libraries have to offer, and most people do not know they exist. So thank you for being an advocate for the librarians fighting the good fight in politics and for the curious kids who will shape the world. Thank you for preaching curiosity and for encouraging your listeners to seek new information. I hope to one day have a fraction of the impact on my library users as you do on the entire cult of the curious. Keep on reading. Kelly. Kelly, you're the fucking best. I'm sure you have uh, more of an impact than you know. I always love running into you. Truly, you're very special. Uh, you have a very just cool glow about you. Just genuinely so nice. You seem so good, so smart. You're a fucking treasure. And so are these libraries. Let us all pray to Nimrod and Lucifina that they continue to receive funding and flourish and inspire more curiosity and intellectual advancement in the world. Hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina, praise Bojangles. And uh, not sure how you would be involved in libraries, Triple M, other than I bet, you know, as Kelly Becky said, people can stream your albums for free. And that is all for today's Time Sucker Updates. Thanks, Time Suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thank you for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast. Scared to death and time suck each week. The secret suck each week for space lizards. Uh, if you find yourself near a black hole this week, be careful. I know that point of singularity is enticing, but you don't want to end up getting spaghettified. Sounds fucking horrific. I sincerely hope that doesn't happen to you. I hope you can just keep on reading and keep on sucking. <laughs> Bad Magic Productions. Maserati Bugatti Spaghetti, Maserati Bugatti Spaghetti, Maserati Bugatti Spaghetti, Luigi Pizza Pie, Luigi Pizza Pie, Luigi Pizza Pie, Maserati Bugatti Spaghetti, Antonio Benedetta's Pizza Pie. I really think I like the Italian version better. Masterclass. Fluent. <laughs>